and Michael Remus. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily for a Wednesday afternoon. Slow, well, slow game day when it comes to professional sports. Uh, this is our one day off in between week 15 and week 16 in the National Football League. And as uh, we have talked about extensively for the last couple of days, the NHL is dark until hopefully the 27th of December when the season resumes. Um, other big news today, which we'll get to in a moment, official word on no NHLers at the Olympics. Of course, that sucks. We're all hoping to, uh, we were hoping to see finally a legit best on best tournament. We're gonna have to wait a couple of years or more for that. Um, but of course the World Juniors are coming up uh, beginning on Boxing Day. Pre-tournament games, I believe beginning tomorrow. Uh, with Canada, Russia, which should be a very, very interesting matchup, considering we've got, uh, you know, two of the best prospects for a couple years draft down the road, including 16-year-old phenom Connor Bedard. So we're going to get to all that with Shane Malloy, and then coming up later on the program, Jets at the break with our good friend Ken Weeb at Weeb's World. Kenny and Rennie, by the way, doing a special show tomorrow, three o'clock after. The Winnipeg Sports Talk Holiday Extravaganza. We're going to do a marble race tomorrow. We're going to introduce a trivia game that you'll be able to play live with us if you're with us on YouTube. We'll have some prizes to give away. And we will have one of the jolliest fellows we know, Paul Edmonds, voice of the Winnipeg Jets, join us uh, to get his thoughts on the club and a look ahead to the post-Christmas portion of the schedule. Fingers crossed that it happens. Uh, coming up on Monday. So uh, going to be a fun couple days heading into the holiday break. We won't have a show on Friday on Christmas Eve, but we do plan to be back at it on Monday before the Jets take on the Minnesota Wild. A, a big happy holidays and thank you to all of our great sponsors, including F Apparel, Vita Health, Culligan Water, Manitoba Battery, Royal Sports, Not Auto Corp, Little Brown Jug, Princess Auto, Boston Pizza, the Nick and Nicky DQ Group, Canadian Club Whiskey, and cool bet canada let's get michael remus in here and get the show on the road remo what's going on how are you hey i'm feeling good i'm ready we're just counting down until uh until christmas right uh days off gatherings oh wait sorry i guess uh, maybe we're not not doing that but um days off more importantly and a christmas mo christmas movies i know uh the new matrix came out today so no no hockey tonight, and maybe I'll. Uh, There's go a see new that. Matrix movie, like with Keanu Reeves. Yeah, yeah, he's in it. Is he in it? He's in it. Carrie Ann Moss is in it, and um, yeah, they're all back. So, how many uh, sequels has he done of the like Matrix? There was Speed Two? No, just in general. Oh. Was there uh, a replacements too? He, he wasn't in Speed Two, but there was a Speed Two. Um, oh, they didn't get him for it. No, it was terrible. It was with a boat that <laughs> wouldn't stop. I think, <laughs> if I recall. Um, I'm trying to think. He was also in John Wick, which I think is basically the Matrix, but he's a different guy. As I haven't seen John Wick, but uh, I'm I I mean I don't know. So there you go. Well, uh, how's everybody doing in chat? Great to see everybody here, and shout out to everybody listening on the podcast. By the way, I often remember to do this later on in the program. We might miss a few people, but um, thank you to everyone that makes us a part of your day on the podcast. I know we kind of see the live reaction from everyone in the YouTube chat every day, uh, but the podcast numbers have been monstrous over the past few weeks. We've set a number of daily records um, again and again, so uh, we want to thank everyone for making us a part of your routine. And if you do have the opportunity to get onto Apple Podcasts and uh, just give us a five-star rating and a review, that would be a nice Christmas gift to us because it certainly helps grow the channel and uh, the rating. Um, 
So, Rima, listen, we'll talk right off the bat. We'll get to the Olympics in a second because I know we did touch on it yesterday, but it is official. And the international hockey, we're going to be talking about this holiday season, is, of course, the World Juniors. Uh, but we finally got news from the Winnipeg Jets late yesterday about how season tickets and tickets were going to work for these games coming up. Now, I will tell you, I was just listening before we went live on the air to uh, Dr. Jaws, uh, Jazz Atwal and Dr. Reimer who are breaking down the latest on COVID and the uh, rise in cases and all that. And I think at this point, um, you know, I'm optimistic that these games are still played and 50% of the, uh, the, the fans are going to be able to go. Uh, but Reem, I'm sure you'd agree that considering the direction this is going elsewhere in the country, and we often follow behind, um, there is the potential that um, maybe these games could be impacted more. But I will say this, um, this week must have been absolutely crazy for everyone behind the scenes with the Winnipeg Jets figuring out how the heck they were going to handle cutting a building that was probably already sold to 90 95% for these games down to 50% for the 27th, the 29th, as well as the two games in early January. Yeah, I think that's a tough, uh, tough position. Sounds like they just cut it in half and said, hey, you guys get this games, you guys got this games. So if you you know you had the games and now you don't, well, you'll get refunded. Pretty simple. For me, Huss, if I have a ticket to those games, I'm excited to attend a Jets game with 7,500 people. Uh, and if I'm not going and you want to go to a game, these are the games to go to, Huss. Um, I'm just like frothing at the mouth here. I love um, your. I love the po the power of positivity. You may yes, as well be a member well, okay. of the new day with this take. Going to the Jets games, okay. So the seventy five. You got half the people, okay. No bathroom lines. You don't have crowded concourses. You can just roam free, do whatever you want. Um, and when you sit down, you're not going to have people like squeezed in beside you. You're going to have so much leg room, so much room to stretch out. Um, and I think people maybe will want to pick up the slack. And be louder because you don't want to seem like you're in an empty building. I think this sounds like a fun experience. That is the <laughs> positive side. Now, I mean, obviously for, uh, you know, the true north, I mean, you're losing uh, half your capacity and ability to sell tickets. But um, if you're a fan, I think the fan experience actually might, might be better. Aside well, from, I mean, you know, the feeling more of being... Comfortable. Yeah, like, you'll be more comfortable. But I don't know if it'll be better in terms of how loud the building can get. But, you know, it's like when... Um, you know, like in the first start of the Jets season, Sheffield and Wheeler were out, and the rest of the team said, hey, we need to pick up the slack. So if you're a fan going to the Jets game, and, you know, half the people aren't there, you're like, well, I need to be twice as loud now, so we can simulate. I'm on board with this take. Big games, too. Yeah. I mean, this Minnesota mm -hmm. game is a monster game. I mean, the, the Jets, having missed the opportunity to play Nashville and Dallas, you know, are going to come out of the, uh, the break, having not played for a week, but at least having a win under their belt with Dave Lowry in a game that I think, you know, they, for the most part, played quite well. You had three lines all making an impact. And, you know, Nikolai Ehlers, and we'll maybe get to this a little later on with Ken, so far through two games, and yes, a very, very small sample size, um, is the guy that has maybe had the biggest bump in production, opportunity, all of those things under Dave Lowry for these last couple of games. And certainly when you look at the metrics and the, XG, uh, all, all the analytic numbers. Um, Ehlers has been popping off the page, and we saw it with a monster game on Sunday. Um, he, along with Mark Shifley and Paul Stastny, really uh, dominating the game. Uh, but let's get back to this ticket thing for a minute. So this is what, I, you know, just as a season ticket holder, this is what I got last night. Uh, I won't read the entire thing, uh, but, you know, just as per the, re, um, the, the new rules last Friday, they're going to 50% for the games from Tuesday, December 21st through January 11th. Uh, so there's four games that are impacted. The game next Monday against the Wild. The game Wednesday against the Chicago Blackhawks. By the way, the Wild game is an 8 p.m. game. And the Chicago game is a 6.30 p.m. game. Uh, Saturday, January 8th against the Seattle Kraken, 6 p.m., and Monday, January 10th, against the Minnesota Wild, 7 p.m. So those were the four games. And as we talked about on the program, I mean, there's no really great way to do this, especially when you're under the gun, the way all teams were that got this news in advance of upcoming home games. Um, so as you mentioned, Remo, they're essentially splitting it up. If you're a season ticket holder and you had four games, you're getting two of them. And two of them, 
you're not getting. Um, so for instance, seats I have upstairs in the upper bowl, I've got the game for December 29, and I've got Monday, January 10th. So what that means is the uh, the Monday tickets for the Wild not happening as well as January the 8th. Now, what's interesting to know, and you know, obviously if you're a second season ticket holder, you've probably got this uh, information. But if you are someone that, for instance, shares tickets with a season ticket partner, so maybe you're in for a quarter and you get ten, uh, sent 10 games, and if this is one of your games, but you're not the primary account holder, these tickets are going back into the account. So you're going to need to talk to um, whoever it is has the season tickets if they're not already on it and have them to go back into their account and resend you the tickets for those games that you do still have. All of the games, regardless, if you're a season ticket holder, four games are returned back into your account. Two of them are unavailable. Two of them are there. But as I said, you'll do, you will need to resend them or redo, um, you know, <clears throat> whoever was getting them, you're going to have to send them back to them. Um, this will be an issue, not as much for people that are share partners, but you do, Remus, wonder how this is going to affect the secondary market. Um, for instance, if you had sold seats on a fan's first or through a friend or something like that, I mean, there will be a trail coming back to it. And it will be the responsibility, I guess, for the season ticket holder, if they've already received funds for that, to get back to the individuals. Now, um, obviously, people are not going to have to pay for games. And at least I'm speaking from a season ticket standpoint. Um, they're not going to have to pay for games that won't happen. Um, you know, much like I think in 2020, when a number of those games were canceled and fans weren't allowed in the building, there'll be a credit back to the account. Um, listen, I, I, I wasn't really surprised, I guess, when I saw it. This was the result of, you know, a difficult situation for everyone involved. And I figured this is sort of the way that it would turn out. Uh, but now at least we have the information. And um, I know that the reps lines are probably going crazy. I can't imagine how much time they're spending on the phone today talking to people and explaining to people how this is going to work. Um, but the bottom line, we do have some clarity. Contact your season ticket partner if you are in that situation or just check your email. You'll find out which games you've got. Um, but it is important that you need to be able to send those again to whoever has them. And uh, I'm fascinated how these games are going to look like, Reem, because as you mentioned, it'll be a half crowd. But I think it's still a fun time of year. I think the people that will be there will be fired up to get going. Um, but just the fact and, you know, how it's spread out. I mean, certainly because all games, I mean, I have upper bowl seats and lower bowl seats, and it was the exact same policy for both. I know some people were thinking, like, well, there's going to be 7,500 people. They're just going to put all the P1s in and make more money off it. Well, it's not really the point of <laughs> spreading the building out 50%. So uh, that's the way it is. I'm sure it's a headache for tons of people involved, but uh, I think they pretty much figured out the uh, the simplest, safest, and fairest way to do this uh, under the gun. Yeah, oh God. Yeah, that's got to be a huge, uh, huge pain, but you know what you got to do? Uh, what's necessary this, this time of year. So... And I do see a lot of people in chat, Huss. I know we have like the NHL postponed until the 27th, but they really are trying hard, Huss, to protect the Winter Classic. And you do have to wonder about that Jets game uh, in Minnesota with the border crossing, or sorry, the Minnesota coming here Monday, and Minnesota playing in the Winter Classic on January 1st. Um, I, do, I do wonder if that game will still Ooh. go. Um, I well, see people in chat uh, wondering, and I've kind of thought that too. As from people are asking our schedule, I mean, I, I think we're planning on we're planning on still being being here next week. But um, yeah, but put it this way: if we're coming out of Christmas weekend, there's been no games. I guess yeah. we can talk World Juniors. Uh, but there's a good chance that at some point, and by the way, hit the uh, hit the uh, alarm uh, on this thing. Make sure you've got your notifications on, because I think there's a good chance that with a lot of downtime over this next little while, we may fire up a special evening stream. I don't know, Remus and I playing PGA 2K21 and uh, bringing some friends in and having some fun. So uh, you're not, first of all, make sure you're subscribed to the channel. I know most of you are that are with us daily on YouTube, but if you haven't, hit that red subscribe button, uh, but hit the bell for the notifications because we do have the opportunity to do some fun things. And I think this is a very good time to do it with the downtime with the hockey club. Uh, but you know what? That's a great point with the Winter Classic. Um, and yeah, the cross border travel, potentially, you know, having guys that can't travel back across the border because of a positive test, certainly concerning right now. That being said, 
I think that, you know, in a lot of ways, what happened this week was shutting the games down early was a little bit preventative to try to get things back on track and have a solid start out of Christmas. I guess the big question now is well, how realistic is that considering what we're facing? Yeah, I guess we'll we'll wait and see. I mean, that's all you got to do. This is the, the, the course that they're taking and we'll go along for the ride. And I do wonder as far as the Jets games, if you'll see a bump uh, on the secondary ticket market for uh, those games with 7,500 fans. I'm just, I'm just thinking about how, how quick I'm going to get home after the game with uh, half the traffic. <laughs> Are you usually the uh, the the beat the traffic guy at the games? Um, the guy that we shake keys at, going, "Hey, beat the Leafs, not the traffic." Where are you going? Depends on how. It depends on the game. It depends. I usually out there before the three stars, I think. And if it's like they're getting killed, yeah, I'll I'll leave, but uh, I'll stick around to the end if it's if it's necessary. Come on. Well, there's been a couple games earlier this year that there were a few people leaving early. But yeah, no, I mean, I'm fascinated. I'm with you. I mean, I'd love to go to these games. I actually, is the way that it's turned out, I don't yeah. think I've got seats for them. You're just thinking about uh, the shorter beer lines, Huss. Come on. Well, <laughs> listen, hey, you know what? The one thing is, in 316, where I'm at in the corner of the upper bowl, we are uh, have the benefit of the bar right there. We've got the bathrooms right around the corner. Very easy to get in and out of the building. So there's no issues on that. But what you mentioned before about the seating, like the thought of being able to go into a game and have an empty seat on each side of you is oh. a dream for anybody in the lower end of spell. Like I, I went and sat with some guys um, uh, that had season tickets in 3.30 a few games ago. And we're only talking about the difference between row one to row three and from the corner to the end zone. But I could not believe. I mean, I think there's like three or four different sizes of seats in the in the building. I realized sitting in that seat that I certainly have the smallest seat in the building when it comes to what's going on at 316 row one. So uh, listen, there'll be a few small benefits, but it does suck that we won't be able to have these full buildings because uh, as I think I mentioned to you before, um, historically, my favorite week of the year for home games for the Winnipeg Jets, and this was even the case in the Moose days when the team had left, um, were those games between Christmas and New Year's because how many people, old friends that might be living elsewhere are back for a week to visit family and friends and are making a point to getting to the game. So it's always an amazing atmosphere. And I think it will still be providing these games go forward. It's just going to be pretty weird with uh, half the asses in the seats that we normally have at Canada Life Centre. Yeah, the, I agree. The, uh, the Christmas time games slash New Year's always fun. A lot of people in town, people off work. Leads to great atmosphere. I mean, the 8 p.m. start on Monday, uh, that's exciting if that does go down. But uh, I think it'll be, it'll be different. But yeah, those, that's the big news today as well as, uh, you know, finally it comes out officially, the NHL not going to the Olympics. This is something, you know, we've kind of been talking about all week. <laughs> but now they put the stamp on it and the press release saying, hey, they're not going to go. And I think it sucks. But as we said yesterday, I mean, you kind of, you get it. I mean, doesn't mean that it's not disappointing, but I think we all understand. It's not like, it's not like in the again, it's not like in the past where they couldn't agree on money or the NHL didn't like the time zone the the, the Olympics was in. <laughs> but uh, but I think it's uh, it's pretty clear, you know, the reason yeah. the reason why they can't do it this year. As much as like, there's very few things that you could get me to agree to that would include the caveat of a potential three to five week quarantine in yeah. China. <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to say that straight up. That does not sound good. And we're not talking about, you know, getting put up in the penthouse of the Fairmont for five weeks. <laughs> I'd be all over that. Um, major questions about how people would be treated, what services they'd had, all that foreign country, halfway across the world. We know China's record with many things involving human rights, not very good. Um, so he understood what the uh, what the issues were, um, and it seemed like it was almost a, a foregone conclusion. It's your boy Bruce in the chat. Is there any Korean baseball on TV? God bless the KBO. Um, I am real, though, having some flashbacks to, you know, last year, early 2020, even when this all started and we really did get shutdowns. And I'm certainly hoping that that does not happen. Um, but with losing the hockey and like a slow night tonight with very little things happening, with the exception of the NBA uh, hiring a bunch of ancient former players to 10 gay contracts to fill out rosters, 
Um, we could be at the moment where I'm betting on uh, Madden simulations again at some point to get through some dark times. Uh, although, here's the thing with the Olympic break, um, the fact that February was down, I mean, it, you would think, and I guess to your point, if they are worried about that Winter Classic and having the Wild go across the border and then back to, uh, south, it would be very easy to cancel that game because the fact of the matter is right now, they're going to have a huge window right now to make up a bunch of games. I believe what there's 50 games that have already been postponed so far. A um, couple for the Winnipeg Jets. You add one more to that. I mean, when you're talking about a three-week window to get those games in, probably not as problematic as this normally would be in a year where they didn't plan to go to Beijing in the Olympic Games. Yeah, and I think that's okay. And they're going to move around games. I think games that are later could be swapped. Uh, I think a lot of it depends on building availability. So, um, I mean, we'll, we'll wait and see uh, what happens with the schedule. But yeah, they have that whole month of February, which I was kind of worried for us. What we were going to talk about is just going to be Olympics. You know, st I'm happy that it will. I'm worried if the Olympics yeah. don't happen. Like if somehow they get to the point, and I'm not sure whether they're past the point of no return, like they're just going to happen if teams or athletes don't go, well, whatever. But if the Olympic Games themselves don't happen, never mind just the NHL is not in hockey and the NHL is not playing, that is going to be some lean times on the sports scene. Um, uh, but you know what? We've done it before in a prior life. We've certainly occupied ourselves, had some fun, and uh, tried to be there for people when there wasn't much else going on. So. If that's the case, we will do it. But as of right now, information from the Winnipeg Jets last night on ticketing for the next few games. And if you are like Remus and think this is going to be the best time to go to a game, there will be some season ticket holders that have games that will be looking to be selling them. I'm just looking back at the correspondence from the Winnipeg Jets, and it does seem like uh, t seats will be able to go on ticket uh, Winnipeg Jets seat exchange so is the ability to post the game tickets for sale on seat exchange, <clears throat> excuse me, is Thursday, the 23rd of December at noon. So tomorrow, an hour before we go on the air, if you are looking for maybe the ability to get to one of these games on the 29th or the 27th or the early games in January, that's the time that's going to do it. Because I think it's safe to say that there's no way they're going to be going back to 100%. That has, that of course has left the barn. Um, but there may be the opportunity to pick up some seats. And if you're looking forward to a little bit more space and that less uh, lines at concessions in the bathroom like Remus dropped, uh, those would be able to be purchased from any season ticket holders selling their seats tomorrow at noon on Winnipeg Jets. Seat exchange. All right, we're going to talk World Junior coming up in just a couple of minutes. Our friends at F Apparel, we told you, you still have time to get that great deal on gift cards, 15% off online up until Christmas. Do that at fapparel.com. But uh, the boys are getting ready for a massive Boxing Week sale. Going from Boxing Day on the 26th to the 31st. 20% off your entire purchase in-store and online. Plus 50% off accessories. Ties, tie clips, pocket squares, socks, etc. and more. Of course, they're downtown 190 Smith Street. The uh, leaders in custom clothing for men, 2022. We're going to get out of this at some point. We're going to be back at events. You're going to need a suit that looks great, that fits. And the guys at F Apparel have your back and have you covered. Um, our friends at Vita Health are ready for uh, for Christmas as well. Um, of course, they've got a lot going on. They're finished up with the organic turkeys. Shout out to everyone that got that order in before the December 19th deadline. Uh, but they are ready to go. A great local company since 1936, 85 years of empowering people to lead healthy lives and a place that has some great local gift ideas, especially as everyone's trying to boost their immune system and be as healthy as possible. Vita Health, probably a great place to start. Um, they've also got all the organic plant-based, gluten-free and natural holiday fixings for the holidays, stuffing, cranberry sauce, baking supplies, eggnog, chocolate, even peppermint flavored marshmallows. Uh, and the store, 24-7, 365, is stocked with Winnipeg's best selection of local, organic, and natural groceries, supplements, and beauty products. Great prices, too. Maybe even invite a gift card for a great last-minute gift or stocking stuffer. Um, they're open until 6 p.m. on the 24th and then closed on Christmas Day and Boxing Day. Seven Winnipeg locations, including the newest store in Linden Ridge and online at myvita.com. And along the lines of Vita Health, 
Um, it all starts with uh, water and keeping yourself hydrated. And Culligan Water is celebrating 65 years in business. And they are the water experts, family owned um, for well more than half a decade here. Uh, they got it all. Water softeners, filters, bottled water coolers, whole home systems, drinking water systems, citywide water delivery services, and not to mention commercial and industrial water products and solutions. And for the month of December, a great deal. Culligan Water, $9.99 a month for the first three months. You can also give the gift of Culligan Water. So give them a call at 694-5180 or check them out online at drinkculligan.com. Um, all right, so we're going to be talking to Kenny Weave a little bit later on. Um, you know, Remo, I've got a screen up here. Do we have Shane? I think Shane Remo? is there. Just There he is. There we go. There we go. Okay, perfect. Well, let's get ready for a little World Junior Hockey Championships. The uh, three tournament games go tomorrow, and then we're dropping the puck on Boxing Day. And uh, our good friend, the host of Hockey Prospect Radio, Shane Malloy, joins the program. Shane, what's up? How are you? Best of the season. I'm doing great. Uh, once again, I love coming on your show. Anytime Remus gives me a call, I'm more than happy to come on. It's weird calling you Andrew. I can't <laughs> even call. I can't even call Michael Michael. Don't bother. I just call him Remus. <laughs> yeah, I don't even bother. I just call him Remus. And you're a hustler. And it's, just, it's it. It seems to happen with all my buddies in Winnipeg. They just have either nicknames or their last name. I never call anybody by their first name anymore out of Winnipeg. It just seems to be the way it is. <laughs> That's the way we roll here in the middle of the country. Um, Shane, what do you make of this tournament? Hey, just before we actually get to what's happening, um, you know, the last couple of days, um, you know, we were just talking for 20 minutes about getting our emails for Winnipeg Jets tickets and how they're handling these games with 50%. Um, big blow for Hockey Canada, losing half of the building, especially after what happened last year. And uh, much like the people at True North have been figuring out what the hell they're going to be doing with these tickets, I imagine that's a massive headache for Hockey Canada, like right before this tournament is starting. Yeah, that's it's a tough blow because what the World Juniors does it helps fund all the other tournaments that don't make as much money and require that budget from the World Juniors to help supplement that. So that's a huge factor in it. And not only that, you know, they help the other you know countries as well in terms of you know putting some funding back into their pockets. So it certainly doesn't help. Um, I know the NHL does its best to help you know, financially fund these tournaments as well and and line the coffers a little bit to make things move smoothly. But, you know, everything trickles down. So I'm not sure exactly what how that's going to impact the budget. It makes it even worse that they can't eat or drink in the stands. Oh, yeah. So no how beer are you supposed sales. to have your, like, no beer sales? Like, unless you're going to, like, willing to stand out in the, you know, out in a concourse and hammer beers, which it is Edmonton. So let's take that with a caveat that is the place I was born and there they will hammer beers wherever they think it's necessary to make sure it happens. So I'm sure they're they're going to get their juice in before the so, game starts well, or even during the game. Yeah, it might be good for some of the local bars and restaurants and you might have a very tuned crowd showing up to see these games going off. You're going to be sitting on your hands with the mask on and <laughs> hey, you just hope the uh, I mean is there any concerns about this event actually going off? I mean from the people that you're talking about, I mean I know it seems they got there, they've sort of been in somewhat quarantine um and they're going to be essentially bubbled. Um should we be confident that this event goes off as planned regardless of how many people are in the building? I'm confident they're going to end up bubbling the players. They're going to reduce the amount of exposure they have. I think the same thing is going to end up happening for us in the media. So I'm flying out early on Boxing Day morning to get in there to the first game. So I fully expect I'm, I've had my booster shot. I'm going to have double masks. I'm going to have like using, you know, hand sanitizer, like it's out of, out of style. So because you just have to do whatever you have to do to try to remain healthy. A bunch and of guys. So I'm crossing my, it's it's going to be crazy. We're going to be separating the press box and like rubbing our hands together with like sanitizer. It's, it's, it is what it is. And you just, as long as I'm in the building, honestly, and the game's being played, I'm happy. Like I, I just can't ask for more than that at this time. I'm just imagining, you know, the media row looking like a NASA space camp with a bunch of guys in space suits right now mixed out. But I mean, hey, whatever it takes to get this done, because as you mentioned, this is a huge event for Hockey Canada, for the double IHF, both from a financial standpoint, that's going to take a hit. 
But for individuals like yourselves that spend so much time looking at the next generation of NHL prospects and stars, this is probably the biggest event of the year, each and every year. I know the link is big when it comes to draft prospects, but there's a lot of top players where we get a chance to see how they compete against their peers in an event that is a much higher stakes than almost anything that they'll normally play before they get to the big leagues. Yeah, in terms of the best on best, uh, particularly the drafted prospects, this is going to be the top tournament. You know, the five nations, four nations, uh, those matter. Uh, under 18s, that matters. You add that into into the mix. I think the Junior A Challenge is, is very underrated. I think that's an excellent tournament as well. But at the end of the day, it's the World Juniors. It's the pinnacle of, of the tournament. So I really do not like missing it ever. Um, Christmas is for my little kids and World Juniors is for dad. Right? So that's my Christmas. Um, I have fun with them that day and then off I go the next day off to the tournament. So uh, to me, I'm just crossing my fingers mm. that there's no notifications coming through my email saying that we're going to reduce the amount, number of people mm. that come in or that it's we're going to cancel it. So I have, you know, three more days, hopefully crossing my fingers that I'm going to be able to jump on my flight and get there on time. Shane Malloy is with us getting ready for the World Junior Hockey Championships. And uh, I imagine the TV ratings will be great because there's going to be a lot of people staying home again these holidays. And we know how big the tournament is. Um, I, I, there's, there's, there's only three returning players for Team Canada. That being said, we know how important this event is to Hockey Canada as a whole. And I imagine there is uh, still a bit of a lingering disappointment from the way things ended up last year at the hands of the Americans. Um, are the Canadians the favorites in your mind? And how much of favorites, if so, Shane? On paper, I think they're the favorites, but by a slim margin. I think if you really look at the last 10 to 12 years, those years of Canada winning five in a row, I think those years are over. I think the other countries have caught up, and it, the World Juniors is very much like the NHL is now. That parity is now set in. So if you look over the last 10 years, the Russians have medaled eight times. Canadians have medaled six um, you know, Canada's medaled six, Sweden's five, Finland's three. Uh, the Slovaks were one. They came in with that, you know, incredible bronze medal. So you really look at it from that perspective and you go, okay, th that year, those years of dominance, I don't, they're not, I don't think they're coming back. But do I think on paper, Canada's the strongest team? Yes. The Americans' defense is tough. Never discount mm -hmm. the Russians, even though they left some guys on the sideline, which I think is going to be a mistake. Uh, Swedes will be tough. We'll see what happens as they get into the medal rounds. They've kind of been floundering a little bit of late to, to really push themselves through. But Jesper Wallstadt's a heck of a goalie, so he's gonna be he's gonna be there too. And never discount those pesky Finns. And we'll see what the Winnipeg Jets prospects do because they have four of them at this tournament. So you know, with Cole Perfetti, Chaz Lucius, Daniel Torgensen, and Nika uh, Chibrikov. If you haven't seen Chibrikov play yet, you're in for a treat. The kid it can dangle, he can score, he's electric. And I know that, I think in the first uh, exhibition mm. game, Canada's playing Russia. Mm. So you're going to see mm. Profetti and Chibrikov go a little bit at it before the real game start. Well, and in addition, I mean, I would suggest folks, if, you know, listen, I'm a person that often traditionally kind of got into the tournament as it went on, and I might miss the Germany game, but... This pre-tournament game against the Russians, no guarantee that these two teams actually play in the tournament. But in addition to what you just mentioned, uh, we're going to get to see Connor McDard and Mitch can go at it. And I mean, that is the sort of the uh, the sub story yeah. that we'll probably be talking about again next year when the tournament goes overseas. But fill us in a little bit. We've heard a lot about Bedard. People haven't heard as much about the Russian, but these are, guys are both neck and neck for being that number one pick, which will surprise a lot of people. Well, they're both equally dynamic. It's not very often that you get to see two players with that level of hockey sense. I mean, that ability to process information at exceptionally high rate and make the right decisions with players bearing down on you. It's like they're playing chess and other people are playing checkers. That's the level, the level of separation that these two players have amongst their peer group. And they're not even playing in their peer group. They're playing against players that are you know, two years older in, in I mean, two and a half years older in many respects. So for them, this is, I think it's an exceptional opportunity to really sort of gauge where they are against, you know, bigger, stronger, faster players and see how they handle themselves. So that's a story in itself. And then looking to see which team's prospects really sort of 
cement themselves in the where they are in their development. And when we have, you know, um, Zinger on from the Winnipeg Jets talking about their prospects, we had him on about a month ago. Like he thought this tournament is really helpful in terms of their the development steps of just being exposed mm -hmm. to that high level of stress. You know, mentally and emotionally where your players are in these type of situations. It's not even necessarily about production. It's really about what they do in restful situations. And can they emotionally put their put that emotion inside of a compartment and and put it away? And then mentally, can they handle that duress and then make the right decisions, even if it's a simple play? Doesn't have to be sexy and dangly, but it's is that the right play? Something that can translate to the NHL. So that's where the NHL teams really focus on their prospects. And that's why I want to see the tournament live, because you miss so much of it with video. I use video all the time. It's a really effective tool, but nothing replaces being at the rink and seeing the nuances behind the play where you don't see it on the screen. Shane, uh, you mentioned Cole Perfetti, one of three returnees for Team Canada. Looks like he's going to have a top-line role, top-line power play. Um, fill us in on your thoughts about Perfetti and where he's at right now after you know being one of the few guys, I think, to really benefit from the pandemic last year, playing in the American Hockey League, being back with the Moose this year, and really being poised to make a statement um, that he's ready for the National Hockey League this holiday season. Well, I think it's a tremendous benefit in terms of emotionally and mentally and understanding what pace he has to play at. So he's going to take a pro level pace into this tournament, not a junior level pace. And that's entirely different. That's the biggest jump. I think in hockey is that jump from junior or college into the American hockey league. It, generally like a lot of the young kids after their first couple of games, they come out and their eyes are big as saucers because they just can't believe how fast and strong these players are. And I think he, he's going to be a guy that you're, they're going to lean on really heavily for goal scoring. He's got a fantastic shot. So I suspect he's going to be in the top 10 scoring in this tournament. I, I think he could end up being a, one of the key players. Very similar to what you know Jordan Eberle did in that Ottawa tournament. I think Perfetti can end up being one of those clutch goal scorers for Team Canada when it's all said and done. Let's keep our focus on Team Canada. As you mentioned, there's three returnees, um, you know, really deep in goal. I mean, a couple taught. We saw Caden Gooley kind of play with the Edmonton Oil Kings just here in the peg against the ice a couple weeks ago um, after being traded. And what a player he is. Um, and Kosa was in net as well that night for Edmonton. They're a very, very well represented team. But, um, Maybe just for folks that aren't familiar with many of the names. I mean, uh, who are going to be the go-to guys for Canada? And, and maybe is there a player or two that you know many people are, are not expecting to have a primetime role that uh, you think can be impactful? Well, I think obviously Owen Power and Caden Gooley on defense, they're going to be the, pow the, the twin powers back there. I think that's going to make a significant difference. For the people who haven't seen Mason McTavish play, you know, he's a third overall pick by the Anaheim Ducks really focus on him because I think he's going to be the catalyst, particularly in the middle of the ice. And he's going to make everything so much easier for his line mates because he's such a big, strong, capable player that he's going to control the middle of the ice defensively and offensively. So he's going to be able to like defend against the other team's best players. And that's going to be, that's going to wear down the other top lines, but it's going to allow the second and third lines to match up against lesser skilled opponents and that's where you're gonna that's where the benefit's gonna lie i think mason mctavish is gonna end up being the straw that stirs the drink offensively and he may he, you may look at him and go well he's not dynamic but he's that power forward center that every team loves to have and just grinds it and does all the little things that you need to win a championship so for me I think it's going to be Mason McTavish and they're all going to sort of rally around him. All the four group are going to like, you know, look to him. Like he's going to be the guy that leads them to, through the charge. We mentioned Connor Bedard and, you know, he's already got a huge name. People are looking forward to seeing him in the tournament. I think people might assume that he's just going to come in and be one of the top players. But I mean, just looking at the line rushes from practice the last couple of days, he's essentially right now a 13th, 14th forward, but we've often seen players in that situation end up on the top line by the end of the tournament. What do you make of Bedard's situation for Team Canada? Will he play, and how might he contribute to a pretty stacked team? It could be a similar situation to Vander Kane. When he started off, he was a 13th forward and moved his way up the depth chart and became a really contrib big contributor to Team Canada. So the advantage for him is if you put him on a third line, that he doesn't have to face the top 
two pairings as often. So it allows his skill set to exploit a third pairing of another team. That's a tactical advantage. Getting him on a second unit power play doesn't have to go against the best penalty killers. So utilize that skill set against weaker opponents. Like if I'm in the coaching staff, I'm looking at guys like Kim and, and Wright to be able to put them in that position along with some other veterans to use that skill set in those situations and not have them do all the heavy lifting. Leave that to the Cole Perfettis and the Mason McTavishes that we talked about. Those guys can do that work. Let those younger skilled guys get the easier offensive zone starts and get the second unit power play and go against the third pairing and like let that skill set run a little bit and let them you know, play with some creativity because that's where you can get that st- that secondary scoring, which you need to get through this tournament. Shane Malloy, Hockey Prospect Radio with us, getting ready for the World Junior Hockey Championships here on Winnipeg Sports Talk. You mentioned Shane Wright. He has been, for most of the year, I would say, and maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong if you're on a different um, wavelength on this, uh, but has been kind of you know the consensus guy that was going to go number one. Um, fill us in on his year so far where he fits into Team Canada, and uh, is he still your number one prospect, and how much is on the table for a guy like that going into his draft year? Well, he's still my number one. I think his year um, statistically hasn't been what other people had hoped for, but I'm not concerned about that because when you end up taking on a leadership role as a captain, you become more a focal point of the offense. You're going to have to make that adjustment, and you're going to be – you're the man. Like, he's the man on his team, and everybody's gunning for him. Now, sort of there's a mental, emotional adjustment to that and taking on that leadership role. So, you know, for the first 20 games of the season, you sort of give them some leeway in that, you know, from what he's done in the first part of the season. What is role in Hockey Canada? It's another advantage where he doesn't have to be the top guy, where if he's the third-line center, okay, great, because he still has all the offensive and capability and his two-way game is sound you can put him out in any situation so you don't have to put him there and do a lot of heavy lifting and you put him in more offensive zone starts he doesn't have to do as much defensively similar to Bedard that's where I would put him because it helps build his confidence I don't think if he has an average world juniors in terms of statistics I don't think it's going to change anything in terms of his draft rating. Somebody would have to come in and really like blow the socks off everybody to knock him off that number one perch, because I think his overall game just translates to the NHL as a number one center. So I don't have any concerns about what he does the rest of the season or in this tournament. If he has a good tournament to me, that's good enough. You know, I, I knew you and the scouts have been watching these players play all year, but a lot of sort of amateur and armchair draft necks sort of begin getting ready for the draft with this tournament. Um, Shane Wright's at the top of the list. Who are some of the other draft eligible prospects that we should be paying attention to and who you're excited to see what they can do? Um, you look at Logan Cooley, uh, Americans. Uh, he's our lone draft eligible. That's a player to keep an eye on. Um, let's see. The Finns have a couple of people in Brad Lambert and Joachim Kamel. Brad Lambert's have an up and down season. So I'm curious to see what he does with that. Uh, Daniil Yurov, uh, another Russian. I think he could have a really strong tournament as well. And then as I go through, look, the Slovaks, the Slovaks have the most draft eligible players. I believe, I think they had five or six. So, you know, Adam Sikora or Serka Ser- Petrovsky, I think all, you know, those players, um, Klemek, Joseph Klemek, I think he's another draft eligible player. So the Slovaks are going to be young, uh, they're skilled, and this is going to be a tough learning curve for many of those players. But those are some of the draft eligibles I'm going to keep an eye on. I think the top end guys are easier to kind of like look at. Um, but you look at, you know, Austria, Switzerland, have a couple of guys in Vincent Royers, uh, Marco Casper. So there's some really good players. I, it's funny in this tournament, I tend to lean away from the top 10, 15 guys in the overall. And I kind of go look at that group that sort of like 30 to kind of 45, 30 to 50, that second round range. Cause I want to see how they adapt and handle that tournament. How do they handle the stress of the situation? How do they react? Because it's a really telling sign of where they are in their development and whether they have that ability mentally, emotionally to control themselves when things get tough. Because you never rise to the occasion. You always sort of fall to your training and to your mental and emotional abilities. So that's why I really sort of take a look at those players in those circumstances. 
Hey, Shane, n normally for a tournament like this, and maybe we'll just go to normal times where we haven't had the impact on junior hockey for the last couple seasons, but with the impact and how important this this tournament is, the competition, how how different is your draft ranking for the first round, for instance, pre-tournament to post-tournament in most, most years? I mean, how many big movers and shakers are they? Or do you have to sort of keep in perspective that we're talking about, you know, 10 days or two weeks and, you know, there's a much bigger body of work for these players. Certainly. I just keep it into a 10 week. Like now, does it have value? Of course it has value. Do I give it more value than it deserves? No, because I've learned from my mistakes of doing that. It's one of the things when you learn to be a scout and you have mentors, they give you that remind you, <laughs> like, don't give it too much uh, publicity or give it too much value based on the whole entirety of that. So there's multiple other tournaments. You have to see how they play in the playoffs. It's just a tick of the box. Does it matter? Sure, it matters. Does it matter more than other tournaments? Yes, I would think so. But it also isn't the end all to be all. And don't get caught mesmerized by a short tournament and get caught in some biases. And these are lessons I had to learn the hard way. I came from a single closet to a double closet, to now to a walk-in closet, a skeletons of mistakes I've made going into my draft list and just going, like, what did I, what did I do here, right? And that's how you learn, you live and learn, and you, you know, you build out a performance management system to help you get better at it. And hopefully, you know, you have a growth mindset and get better at it every year, but every year there's always mistakes made, it happens all the time. Yeah, you, you got to get the reps in and sometimes you learn the hard way, uh, especially in that game where uh, nobody is always right. Sheen, you mentioned Chaz Lucius, and we talked about Canada and some of the draft eligible prospects, Jets first rounder from last year. I, I know a lot of people haven't seen, we're going to talk to Ken Weave. He went down to UND and saw them play a couple weeks ago, but um, just tell us about this Jets first rounder, what we know of his year so far, and uh, how he projects and, uh, you know, his level of importance to Team USA. Well, his level of importance is he's, he has the ability to score goals. And if he plays in the, in the middle of the ice, he gives them a different dimension. A lot, You know, traditional, a lot of scoring comes from the wings. And the center tends to be a dis distributor and he moves the puck around. But in this case, he's more of a goal scorer, which I like that. It gives the Americans a different angle. So I think he's going to be leaned on, along with Matt Coronado, about scoring a lot for scoring for the Americans – in a lot of critical situations. One of the things I liked about him in our conversation I had with Zinger is that, you know, the knock on him going into his draft year is his skating and his pace wasn't at the level it needs to be. So he worked his rear end off in the off season. And like in his conversations with Winnipeg said, no, I think you're wrong. And actually, you know, went back against them and said, no, I like what I, you think I am and what I think I am is different. And I'm going to go out and show you that it's different. And for all, in, you know, all cases, his skating and his pace has improved. And I think you're, it's going to showcase at this tournament where he recognizes what how he has to play to be successful. But it's really hard to find a player who can score goals like that. So the Jets have two, like, prolific goal scorers in Perfetti and Lucius at this tournament. And then a real dynamic playmaker who can, in Nikita Cherbakov, who can also score goals. I mean, what's the most important, hardest thing to do in the league? Either scoring goals or stopping them, right? So I think the Winnipeg Jets in the last couple of years have like really ad like identified it, but also these guys have sort of fallen into their lap a little bit. I don't think they should have got Perfetti. I don't think they should have got Chibrikov where they did, but they did. So sometimes you got to be a little bit lucky and good on the Jets for that. And if you look at their, you know, their scouting success, they've done a very, very good job. They're in the top 10 in terms of identifying talent and, and developing them. And there's a mat, they have a massive advantage. Their American league team is in the same city. And if people don't think that matters to the prospects when they sign, it matters because they can just get their apartment or their condo in Winnipeg and they never have to move. And all the development department, their coaching staff, the management staff, they're all there. And that is a tremendous advantage to an organization. So I'm curious to see what the feedback is from the Jets fans when they get to see these prospects play. No, really looking forward to it. Well, speaking of Jet fans, I mean, Kenny's water bottle in the chat asking, uh, with his AHL experience, is it too much to expect Perfetti to have a pretty dominant performance at the World Juniors? I imagine that's certainly what Team Canada is hoping. No, I don't think it's too much to ask because I think he's in a position to do that. I think his goal scoring ability and because of his experience in the American League, I don't think it's, you know, you don't want to throw like all the pressure on him, but he certainly has to be one of the top three scorers 
or if in point producers, let alone for Team Canada, for them to be successful. Like he has the mental and emotional capability and the skill set to do that. And he should be the top goal scorer on this team. He has that capability. So I'm looking forward to seeing what he does. I'll put like, you know, hard on, you know, it's, you know, easy for me to put pressure on the poor kid, but I think he puts enough pressure on himself. And I think he has the potential to be, you know, an excellent player for team Canada and a real difference maker. Shane, thanks so much for doing this. You know, uh, it, once we get into February without the NHLers and the Olympics, and especially with the Liga shut down, we have to get you just back for a segment. We can talk about what we saw at the World Juniors, but Remus and I actually want to talk more about player ratings for EA Sports NHL hockey. Sure. But we'll do that at some point, Heather. Well, Absolutely. Hey, just fill people in. Uh, what do you be up to throughout the tournament, and uh, where will people be able to see uh, any of your coverage or uh, hear it? Well, uh, our show's on NHL Network Radio, so... Uh, will be our second preview show will be aired on Christmas Day and then twice on Boxing Day as well. And then we're going to do a show on the 1st of January, just reviewing what the games happened. And we'll do a full review on the 8th of January. So we'll get two hours in both Brad and I, Brad Allen and I will get into it uh, pretty heavily. So it's what we love. It's all about prospects and the kids coming up through the system. So it's always fun times. It's my best time of the year. And uh, say hi to Ken for me. He's a good man. Uh, I certainly will. Uh, and listen, all the best to you and your family over the next few days. And uh, then enjoy the World Juniors. Uh, you know, Can't wait for it. And I think this is a time where we really need this tournament considering everything else that's happening around the country. Uh, be well, my friend. Thanks for doing this and happy holidays. Take care. Happy holidays to everyone in Winnipeg. There it is. Shane Malloy on Twitter at Shane Malloy. And of course, the host of Hockey Prospect Radio. Um, all right, Kenny, we is coming up in just a second. They have big happy holidays to our friends, Donnie and the gang over at Manitoba Battery. Might not be the sexiest gift, but batteries, booster cables, they have a great deal on boosters right now. Probably a great thing um, to, uh, you know, not only to be a great gifter, but also to avoid on uh, having to boost somebody during the uh, during the winter. Uh, you can see Remus uh, got that the $60 booster cable, 25 feet um, 20 foot, 500 amp booster cables. Uh, the big ones only 69.50 when you pick them up. They've also got the one gauge for $60. Uh, sled batteries between 65 and 75 dollars for almost all makes and models. And of course, the best prices on automotive batteries. As we get cold, don't wait until it's minus 30 and you need a new one. Get proactive. They'll test it for you free down at Manitoba Battery. Find them online, ManitobaBattery.com. They're at 1026 Logan Avenue or give them a call at 783-8787. I went to Royal Sports yesterday. Uh, everyone knows it's my favorite store. They've got pretty much everything, whether you're on the ice, off the ice, fan gear. Um, the Bomber Championship merch is flying out the doors. I'd suggest you get down there ASAP if you want to pick up some of that for the holidays. And man, do they have an incredible selection of Winnipeg Jets gear. We actually picked up a couple nice toques, a Grey Cup championship hat for the Bombers, which we'll be doing uh, for some trivia games coming up, including one of them tomorrow on the WST holiday extravaganza. So make sure to join us for that. Um, but yeah, you can take care of all of your shopping needs at Royal Sports, 750 Pemina Highway. Get in there before Christmas. And then of course, next week, check out all of their great Boxing Day deals beginning on Boxing Day. And a big happy holidays to our friends at Not Auto Corp. Great sponsors of ours since day one. Uh, it, well, if you want to really step it up this year, maybe you put a Tesla under the tree or in the garage for a friend. They got about 30 of them there on the lot, as well as a ton of other incredible vehicles. And if they don't have what you're looking for, they will help you get it. Why not get into the car of your dreams at a great price with the help of the Not team, Waverly and McGilvery, or online at not.ca and make sure to check out that new Winnipeg Car Lab, which is now open and operational and doing amazing things. All right, let's welcome in for a festive holiday visit from one of our favorite friends, the one and only Weeb's World himself, Kenny Weeb. Weeber, best of the season to you. How's it going? Awesome. It's uh, great to be with you. Uh, Merry Christmas to you. I've got a little festive red going, also the uh, color of the Pemina Valley Hawks. Uh, suited up in the uh, alumni versus present team game last night in Morden and uh, happy to report uh, the old dogs uh, taught the youngsters a bit of a lesson last night. Nice to see any mass in the crowd. 
Uh, yeah, there were masks. Yes, <laughs> They're happy to report all masks. Uh, you were not allowed into the building without one. So uh, good news. Double vax players, uh, masked up fans. Uh, it was it was a good evening all around. Hey, speaking of a festive, how, how do you feel about the uh, the fire in the background? The warm fire in the Christmas tree. Shaw, uh, that's impressive. It makes me think of the uh, Shaw Yule time log husk, but I think yes! it's even more impressive because you have the tree element in there as well. Uh, I, I should have got a tree uh, set up in the background also, but I had enough trouble trying to uh, get the blinds at the right uh, uh, opening level width in order for it to not be either too sunny or too cloudy in in the uh, in the makeshift office slash spare bedroom here. Uh, at uh, Weeb's World, you just gave, you just you just gave me a great idea. Uh, maybe instead of the Shaw Yule log, we can just do a, like a twenty four hour stream all through Christmas of just the there background on Winnipeg Sports Talk. People, you know what? If you don't want to throw Sean, get the computer up. We'll have it on YouTube. Hit I that like it. button and subscribe to twenty four hours of a Christmas tree and a fire on a blank screen. Huss, we're looking for solutions all the time. Uh, we just made the world a better place uh, for a few days here. I love uh, I love to see it. And also right back at Shane Malloy. Uh, great that you had him on here. Uh, Shane is a great man and, uh, you know, top notch when it comes to the prospects. That's for sure. Absolutely. You know what? Let's, why don't we start there? We'll get to sure. the Jets and, you know, kind of at this break and the NHL stuff. But, um, but uh, you know, you were the one guy, and I mentioned this to Shane. You went down and saw Chaz Lucia's play um, down at UND a few weeks back. Jets with four prospects. I've certainly Lucius at the top of the list. He mentioned Chiprikov as well, though. Looking forward to seeing him. And Cole Perfetti certainly looks destined to be a uh, go-to guy, an impact player for Team Canada when it comes to Jets prospects. Yeah, for sure. And, and Daniel Torgerson will also suit up for Sweden. Uh, he was a guy that I wasn't sure was going to be on the roster. And, and to be you know, also fair to Dmitry Kuzman, uh, just helped get Belarus back into the A pool. Uh, for next year, it sounded like Kuzman had a, a solid event as well with five points in the five games. So I uh, actually just got off the phone with Jimmy Royce a little while ago to work on a prospect story on Sportsnet.ca that will go up later today. Shane touched on it. Uh, Cole Perfetti will be one of the go-to guys. Obviously, we know Caden Gooley is the captain, but Perfetti uh, being one of those key leaders and should be one of the top offensive dynamos for Team Canada here. Uh, Chibrikov is off to a very, very solid start over in Russia there. Uh, expect him to be a real key cog as well. He's an alternate captain for Russia, which as an 18-year-old, has that's a pretty impressive quality. Here's a guy who's worn the C at the under-18s before. Uh, really a nice offensive weapon for Russia. Torgerson, season's been a little bit uneven. I guess he's had some injuries and with COVID, but uh, a real kind of uh, workout aholic, if you will, and a guy who's a real big body, plays a kind of a power forward kind of game, but also has some pretty uh, good hands. So excited to see him. We know Team Sweden, uh, at least during the round robin portion, Hus, has been a dominant force here at this event for quite some time. Uh, and then Chaz Lucius, who, as you mentioned, I mean, I had a chance to see him uh, at UND uh, the one night. Uh, and speaking with John Rosie for our uh, long form show, he was able to see him both at the under, uh, the USA camp and then also, uh, you know, Minnesota was also down at Michigan the previous weekend to that. So uh, Chaz is off to a great start. And again, John was saying that there has been some time that Lucius has been on a, a line with Matty Beneers, the uh, Michigan Dynamo. So if he can if he can spend some time on the wing there, he's got the opportunity and potential to score some big time goals uh, in this event as well. But again, 18 year old, it's usually a 19 year old tournament us, but uh, because of COVID in a lot of ways, some of these younger guys might be getting a little bit more of an opportunity uh, than what we're used to seeing in prior events. So uh, it's a great it's a bit important time for Jets management to watch their prospects. But uh, there's some really a big opportunity for some guys to play some really key roles uh, for their respective countries. You know what? It's funny. And I just mentioned this to Shane last hour, Kenny. Um, you know, usually I've never been a guy that is like, you know, ready to go for the <laughs> drop of the puck on the 26. I sort of ease my way into the tournament and, you know, follow the stories and, you know, watch the big games. This year, though, tomorrow night, I, I want to see this Canada-Russia pre-tournament game. Right. Um, we got Connor Bedard going up against Mitchkov, who a lot of people don't know. But, you know, from talking to some people that are very into scouting, um, Bedard is this incredible prospect. But Mitchkov is the Russian version of that, although destined to stay in the KHL a little while after he's drafted. So that may affect things going on. But as far as a head-to-head -head matchup of 16-year-old players... Um, these two young men will go at it. And I'd imagine Bedard will get a chance to play. Very different in his situation, though. He's on right. such a stacked Canadian team. He's right now projecting as the 13th or 14th forward. I do hope we get to see him, at least, though, in that pre-tournament game. 
Yeah, for sure, Huss. I mean, I think that Bedard will be one of those guys who starts, you know, maybe more of a power play, you know, specific role. I mean, even too, like, this is something that Kale McCarr had to do. And look at what Kale McCarr is doing <laughs> in the NHL right now. So uh, where a guy starts a tournament isn't always where he finishes. But uh, as you mentioned, I mean, Sam Cosentino mentioned uh, that Russian Dynamo as well uh, this week with Jeff Merrick. Uh, I'm excited to watch him as well. And I mean, back to Perfetti. I mean, speaking of draft eligibles uh, for this year, not next year, I mean, Cole Perfetti was playing with Shane Wright, uh, you know, in the last couple of days at the at the practices for Team Canada as well. So uh, that could be a very prolific combination there. Uh, so for me, I mean, it, it's always interesting to see how these things get started and get rolling. And we know it all. All that matters to Team Canada is when the medal round starts. But you don't get to that point without having some success early and kind of laying down that foundation, putting in those building blocks. Uh, we know they've got uh, some guys that are back. We can know they've got guys who suited up in the NHL and are very determined to be part of a gold medal winning team. And uh, I think it'd be fascinating to watch uh, all the teams in all the countries because they all have their own kind of, you know, you get USA wants to defend. Sweden wants to show that they're uh, not just a round robin team. And, you know, Russia, you, you can never discount their club. Uh, uh, that's for sure. And then Finland, right? I mean, Finland is kind of one of those countries that is pushing to be in that equation and to be in that upper echelon tier. Um, moving forward so i think it'll be a fun event and as you mentioned Huss, with with all that we've heard with the you know the shutdowns and the loss of the olympics i think uh as long you know we know the capacity will be half in alberta now as well but i mean this is an event that people will look forward to um and for a good reason i mean it's a tough time uh, on a lot of fronts so this is kind of that holiday tradition that uh, a lot of folks can get behind and really enjoy listen i'm not gonna put you up to it breaking down all of the teams <laughs> in the tournament um but you mentioned Sweden and that ridiculous right. record. What they had forty-eight straight round robin wins um, and hadn't won the gold medal. That streak finally ended. Is that going right. to be? Is this going to be the year that they actually get it done? Uh, interesting squad and a great program, and it just seems to be so cyclical with almost every other team, with the exception of Canada. Although, yeah, I think you could even include Canada in that now. Very different world than this tournament was 10, 15 years ago. For sure, us and I mean uh, the goaltending factor is something that it's so interesting when it comes to Team Canada. It, you know they've sometimes had some you know not lesser lights might be a little bit of a stretch, but it's not always a top prospect between the pipes for Team Canada. I mean that that will be a little bit different this year uh, with Kosa, but uh, I mean Sweden's got an elite level goaltender as well. So I mean as long Sweden we know they're very structured, they are very disciplined. They have enough offense. They're very strong defensively. And this year, they will have elite-level goaltending. So uh, I wouldn't sleep on the Swedes, but I think it's fair to say that Canada and USA would be the two uh, front runners for the event. But, I mean, there's always always kind of one of those sleepers or a team that kind of gets hot, like a Denmark with Nikolai Ehlers uh, a couple of years ago. So uh, it'll be very interesting to see how it all breaks down. And, yeah, I mean, there, there's so many reasons for folks to watch all over the country, but especially for, you know, Jets fans in, in the market where we reside. Well, there's a, a ton of props and the bets to be uh, had on the event, too. We'll get to that on the Cool Bet lines a little later on today without anything really going on tonight, the exception of uh, an exciting edition of AEW Wrestling, I'm sure, <laughs> around 8 o'clock. Uh, uh, but, Ken, let's move on. We'll get to the big NHL stories in a minute, the Olympics sure. and all that. But, uh, I mean, you were kind enough to join us impromptu on Friday. Um, was not expecting a second visit, but when Paul Maurice leaves the Winnipeg Jets, we put out a call to Kenny um couple games removed from it um what did you think of the jets both friday night and sunday getting that very important win to up the joy levels as you like to say heading into a christmas <laughs> break would have been a very different story i think for the players and honestly the fan base despite everything else going on if they had been able to get a very big win against a division rival in st louis sunday afternoon for sure, Hassan. And as you know, uh, I'm always on alert for the bat signal when it goes up. So, you know, you you, you make the call. Uh, uh, we, we we answer the bat signal whenever possible. Uh, you know what? I actually thought the Jets played pretty well uh, on Friday in the debut, considering all of the, uh, I wouldn't say turmoil, but emotional emotional turmoil is a term that I would use for what the Jets kind of had to go through uh, on Friday morning, uh, you come to, you know, you've prepared for the week. Uh, you've had two days of practices uh, and then a bombshell kind of landed in their lap, uh, quite frankly. And, you know, for a lot of the players in that room, Paul Maurice is the only voice that they've known uh, behind a bench. So, I mean, that would have been tough to deal with on a lot of levels. 
Uh, you heard a lot about, I mean, that's also a jarring event for many of those guys to go through their first firing. And uh, you always have to look in the mirror or look inwardly when a moment like that happens, because us, as we know, it's easier when the coach is replaced because you can't replace 10 to 20 players. So you're going to have to look uh, in the mirror and kind of answer the bell and all of those uh, sort of elements when it, when it, when a situation like that occurs. Uh, for me, I thought the Jets played with the you know some spark, but you know their their finish wasn't quite as strong. Uh, their first period against Washington, I thought it took them a while to get going, but the last two periods they were quite strong. But uh, just had a couple of big time you know breakdowns, and that ended up in the back of the net against a, a Washington team that continues to get it done. I mean, there were a bunch of Hershey Bears in the lineup uh, that night, and that didn't seem to bother them one bit. Uh, and, you know, obviously Vanacek played great between the pipes, but uh, I thought that Ehlers was outstanding on Friday. Uh, and I thought that that line with Mark Shifley and Paul Stastny really even elevated to a further level in the Sunday uh, of uh, matinee with the St. Louis Blues. Uh, actually, I also thought the Dubois line was quite good uh, in both games, especially Sunday. I mean, I think Dubois had, I think, 10 sh- uh, shot attempts again and a couple of breakaways it seemed like they were it was it was the first night in a while Huss, where both the top two lines were rolling at the same time which is something that we've talked about for months now seemingly on end uh it was it was it was Shifley and Ehlers and Stastny you know taking care of the production side of things but I thought that uh, both of those two lines were really uh, moving at a pace that uh, we hadn't seen as many nights as as the Jets, quite frankly, need them to be going. Uh, and the other thing, obviously, that we have known and seen from the first two games of the Dave Lowry era is that he has gone back to the hard match. And that's meant a lot mm-hmm. of ice time for Adam Lowry and Andrew Kopp. Uh, and it's earned ice time. I know, you know some folks are you know, quite getting... <laughs> riled up on Twitter as they've been known to do. Uh, but I, I think quite frankly, Huss, that third line has lacked an identity for the majority of the year. And since moving Andrew Kopp and Adam Lowry back together, the identity is quite clear and the results quite frankly speak for themselves. I mean, they did a great job against Ovechkin uh, on Friday and they did a very good job against, you know, O'Reilly for the most part. But I mean, there was some movement with, I mean, obviously, we know that the uh, the Russian line has also been rolling pretty well for St. Louis, but uh, those guys have done a nice job. And again, their minutes are high because both those guys are also playing on, you know, A, the number one penalty kill, and Kopp is on the first power play, and Lowry is on the second. So uh, that's been the biggest difference that we've seen so far. And the, the thing that we talked about, Huss, the thing that we were going to be watching going into the weekend games, what would the disparity in ice time be between the top two centers? Uh, the 1A and the 1B, Uh, it was six minutes against Buffalo and change. And on the weekend games, it was closer to two minutes uh, in between the the ice times between Dubois and Shifley, maybe just a little bit a shade over that on Sunday. Uh, But again, that was more related to uh, just how well that that line was really rolling. That was the one time where it was completely justifiable to be playing them more. Although at the same time, and I'll kind of echo what you had to say, I know they didn't get rewarded on the score sheet. but I mean, Pierre Luc Dubois had a monster game on Sunday. I, mean, I can't he remember. Did. I think he had ten shot attempts. If, yeah, if seven I'm not shots mistaken. and ten attempts. Yeah, so 10 I mean, or he 11. was everywhere. And I mean, Connor had a rough week, certainly on the stat sheet. I think he finished minus nine or something like that. But um, it was good to see those guys get together, and that might take a a game or two to maybe regain where they were when they were broken up, because that yeah. was clearly the number one line. But from a Jet standpoint, and certainly Dave Lowry, I think, went to sleep feeling a bit better. And maybe no one more than Mark Shifley to finally yeah. make something out of so many opportunities lately. Um, and when you're not scoring, it amplifies maybe some things that aren't going well in your defensive end. And um, I thought that was just a massive game for that line. And I really, I think Nikolai Ehlers was leading the way. But Paul Stastny seems to be a great compliment with them. And uh, sometimes, you know, for a player like Shifley, I think you just need a few good things to happen Um, get the momentum going in the right direction. Hopefully that can continue. Well, I mean, I love the honesty. I mean, it's, you know, when we've seen Mark go through tough times this year, we've, you know, we've heard many of the old cliches about, yeah, it's just a matter of time, but to hear him speak so frankly and honestly and saying it felt like there was a brick wall up there. (laughs) I mean, it had to have felt that way for Mark Shifley at times, given the quality of scoring chance he has been able to, uh, get during that stretch. I mean, he rattled one off the post against Washington. You know, it's a totally different game if that happens. But you're right. I mean, I think that here's a guy that knows that, you know, there's a new sheriff in town. 
that the old pecking order is uh, been crumpled up and tossed in the old recycling bin and you're going to have to earn everything that you get. So, I mean, obviously we know how the, 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 the rubber will meet the road when Pierre-Luc Dubois is the guy at 21 and Mark Scheifele is the guy at 18. And then you want to see how both players respond. But uh, uh, what you have to like about what Mark Scheifele did was that he rose to the occasion. I mean, we know that this was he was going to be challenged. He was going to be one of those guys looking internally and saying, man, uh, I have to be better. I mean, this he's one of the most important players on that team. Uh, you, talk, you We both touched on it here. Nikolai Ehlers was the driving force on the weekend. Uh, but I also think we can't underestimate the importance of a guy like Paul Stastny. He has become the conscience of this team, Huss. And at a time when a team had the you know potential to unravel, Paul Stastny comes up with his most important game of the year. And you know exactly how much this player means to this entire group. By the way, Nikolai Ehlers reacted. I mean, he couldn't get into that net fast enough to pick up that puck. And he wasn't giving it his own personal celly. He couldn't wait to get that, that puck into the hands of the trainers to get that 500 club. Uh, and, and then, too, just to see them talk the way they were sitting at the podium and Stassi going out of his way to say, you know what, I wanted you to score the goal I got my 500 assist on. I mean, we've we've heard about these guys speak glowingly about one another, but that level of frankness and honesty, again, I'm going back to that same word, it, it's so refreshing to hear – uh, people talk so openly about it. I mean, it, you know, it was it's nothing against the other guys, but I mean, Paul sort of rejuvenated his own career. And part of the reason is because of the symmetry and chemistry he has with a guy like Nikolai Ehlers. Uh, we know that one of the reasons Stassi was brought back was because of his connection with Mark Scheifele, the way that those guys love to dissect games and, and break things down and that love of the sport and love to try to get better. So uh, I think Stastny was really important on the weekend as well. And I think the other thing too, Huss, I mean, obviously with you know, Svechnikov being going out with that, uh, I, I think it's a left knee injury. He's going to be out for a couple of weeks. Um, I mean, there was obviously an adjustment process there, a big opportunity for Christian Veselainen, who, I mean, there were some opportunities, but I think quite frankly, I'm not sure if that's the way the line is going to stay. I think it'll be interesting to see what happens. You know, Gus sounds like David Gusson will be back for practice on the 26th. Um, I mean, I could see Jansen Harkins getting a look up there uh, at some point. I know we saw Harkins go out late with with the identity line, if you well, will, that, I, I was, replacing I, yeah. Dominic Tone and Otto. I mean, I wonder if that's a, a way that Dave Lowry could go coming out of the break as well. There's a few moving parts that are happening right now us when it comes to line composition. Well, I, you know what? Let's just talk about Harkins for a minute because mm-hmm. uh, that was exactly what I was going to mention. I mean, as much as we're talking about guys that you know might fit, you know, in the short term with well in particular with Dubois uh, and Connor and I still think it's up in the air as to you know who I mean Blake Wheeler was playing pretty well when he went out I mean I'm not sure well, well I guess that's a whole other thing where he fits in it depends on who's healthy what's going on and yeah. that is down the road but I think Jansen Harkins has continued to show the coaching staff that he's ready for more I wasn't surprised that he got that opportunity and I, I certainly expect that you know Fingers crossed we have this game on the 27th against the Minnesota Wild. I'd be stunned if it wasn't Jansen Harkins going out with Lowry and Kopp to begin that game and presumably playing, you know, throughout if things go well for that unit. Yeah, for sure. And one thing we should also maybe just quickly touch on the fourth line. I mean, they didn't get a lot of ice time only in the four minute range, but I I really liked a lot of what we saw from Christian Reichel. Uh, We've known for years that he was always a Pascal Vincent favorite because of his ability to just kind of fit in. It was interesting. I mean, he only played a limited amount of minutes, but he fit. He, he didn't make any glaring errors. I mean, he nope. was always in the right spot. You saw a little bit of, you know, feistiness on the forecheck. He's got some skill to make some plays. Uh, he's the kind of guy that you're going to see again down the road, uh, you know, whether he can make it as a regular or not, or when that happens uh, remains to be seen. But I thought that both Cease and Reichel provided a little bit of energy uh, in that game. Uh, in terms of Tone and Otto, I mean, the effort is always there. But, I mean, here's a guy who's trying to establish himself, A, on an identity line, and B, as a penalty killer. But he's taken three penalties in those two games. I mean, it's tough to be in the penalty-killing mix when you're sitting in the box and having to have that penalty killed. And obviously, you know, that's from a guy trying to do maybe a little bit too much and uh, you know, one of the calls was kind of a ticky tack call as well. But uh, back to Harkins, I mean, I, I think the effort from Jansen Harkins is always there. And this is something that will always stand out for me. Huss, I may have even said it last week, but when Harkins was going through the tough time 
of being that healthy scratch for such a long period of time. He was always staying out with the taxi squad guys. He was Dave Lowry was always the guy that was the ear for Jansen Harkins, which also meant he saw the work that Jansen Harkins was putting in to try and stay ready for when his opportunity came. Uh, to me, that's always something that is that that always sits. Would with Would he have coaches. been part of that decision to play Ton Natto above him when they went into the playoffs? Because that was the one that shocked all of us. And if I sure. do recall, Paul Maurice said, "Well, this was actually a suggestion from the coaches and the guys that had been watching them do what they were doing." Yeah, no, I mean that that's always one where I mean it ended up working out okay for them in terms of the GWG for Ton and Otto, but uh, it was one of the you know one of the great mysteries for sure. But, you know, Harkins is a guy who just has to keep working at it. I mean, uh, he's a guy that the opportunity is going to come. Of course, it's never coming as fast as one player would hope. Uh, and the other thing, Hutch, that, I mean, we've touched on it a couple times, maybe also on Kenny and Rennie. I mean, if I'm Kevin Shevel day off, I'm on the phone to Ron Francis right now. I think that Mason Appleton is a guy who uh, is conceivably available. You hear in the rumor mills, maybe it's not true, maybe it is. But that would be a call that I would be making, and I'm guessing it has already been made. Uh, you have to find out what the price tag was, but it's certainly not going to be what the price tag was in the summer when Ron Francis wanted a first rounder for from everybody to not select player A from your group. Uh, if you're the Jets and you can get Mason Appleton back, you have a built-in chemistry. You have a guy who can kill penalties. You have a guy who's making $900,000, I believe will be an RFA one more time at the end of this contract. And you have a guy that if Andrew Kopp works his way back into the top six, like we know Andrew Kopp wants to do, you can still have Mason Appleton and Adam Lowry handle the responsibility of being the checking line plus line. And, you know, in the interim, if you have the three of them together, you're comfortable putting those guys out against any line in the National Hockey League. So for me, I think that would be something to watch for as well, coming out of the roster freeze. Uh, and again, deals are tougher to make in December than they are in March. We know that is the case, but I think this is a situation where both you and I and everyone in the hockey world thought that maybe Appleton would go to a place where he didn't have as many people ahead of him on the depth chart, and it just hasn't worked out to be the case for him. I mean, he had a little minor injury, I believe, that he missed a little bit of action, but for whatever reason, sometimes you don't maybe click as well with a with a coaching staff or a or a line combination. And what we've also known in the past is that Mason Appleton is a great finisher. He's not always a great starter. I think last year was kind of the exception to that rule when it comes to his career. But he'd be a guy uh, that would check a lot of boxes if the Jets were able to make a deal for a you know second tier prospect or a you know not a first round pick, but maybe kind of a mid mid round pick uh, if they might be able to secure a deal to to acquire his services. But the other part too, I mean, Gustafson obviously it was you know sucked quite frankly for him to borrow Kyle Connor's words and speaking about the Olympics to get hurt on your third shift and to play two in the third, your second period and not, and to have the Gus bus parked so early in the uh, recall tenure. But um, he's a guy that it sounds like he'll be back uh, for practice and, and be raring to go. And uh, one quick thing, you touched on the game on the 27th. Hus I mean, we don't know anything in terms of the you know schedule being very fluid, but we can't forget that the Minnesota Wilders are scheduled to play in the winter classic on January 1st. And it would not be a surprise if that game is put on pause, especially with that uh, two or three week window in February opening up, I would say the wild are probably going to be a little hesitant for cross border travel, you know, in the days leading up to what is such a marquee event and a big time revenue generator for both the team and the league itself. Would it, I mean, is it any different traveling to Winnipeg across the border than if you're traveling to Nashville to play a game? Well, no, but I mean, you got to remember Huss. I mean, if you, if you get COVID here, I mean, the player is stuck here unless he gets the charter flight, like what we saw with the Yesa yeah. right? So I would say that. I guess if they're getting COVID, they're probably not uh, on the 27th. No, they're probably not playing in the Winter Classic on the 1st. For sure. But I mean, it, that's what I mean. I think that they probably want to, you know, Jeff Merrick used the term, put those teams in bubble wrap, like St. Louis. And the last thing that, that you want on the Winter Classic is for uh, the American Hockey League teams to be playing one another. <laughs> Welcome with to all, Springfield with, Falcons. With all due respect, to those franchises and i mean those players would love to have that event but i mean this is their marquee event i think you uh, we already know that joel erickson eck is injured i think jared spurgeon is questionable for the game itself um i just uh, for me i would not be surprised again this is not inside information this is just kind of trying to connect the dots here um 
in our in our daily game of Connect Four Hus, but uh, I just don't, I don't know how likely it is to have that game be played on the 27th. I hope there's hockey, but we also need to see what are the test results going to be like on the Boxing Day games for all the teams, including the Jets, because we know when travel is happening, and this is all going to be commercial, or a lot of it's going to be commercial travel. So, uh, you know, you're in airports, you're in places. I mean, it sounds like this variant is uh, rapidly spreading. So you hope that everyone is is able to stay safe. But here's the thing. You can do everything safely and still get the virus and then yeah. be knocked out for 10 to 14 days. So um, it's a, it's a interesting time for sure for all you know, all players in the league and, and society as a whole, us. I mean, we, everyone's going to try to be as careful as they can during the holiday season here. I've got a solution for this 27th game. Okay. Send send the Iowa Wild up here to play the Jets. <laughs> They'll take the two points. The Wild hey. will be safe, and then they can go and do it. Although, you say Let's that. not forget and, San Jose Barracuda. Don't forget I, about the same game against the Barracuda listen, Hustles. Listen, I don't want to I don't want to <laughs> rip, rip these Band-Aids <laughs> off from what we've gone through. Um, Nikolai Ehlers. Yeah, uh, had a monster weekend. Um, he was the best player on the ice on Sunday. And sure. again, we're talking and about a Friday, soup. Probably. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I guess this is what I'm getting at. Um, it's a very, very small sample size. But man, if you look at, you know, any of the analytical numbers from the last couple of games, I mean, he just jumps off the page. Is Nikolai Ehlers the guy that stands to benefit the most from the coaching change? I mean, he's certainly at the near at or near the top of the list, Huss. But what I would also counter with is that his ice time was very similar to what he was getting under Paul Maurice. I mean, the only thing that has really changed is that he's playing with Mark Shifley a little bit more. But I mean, Ehlers was also playing with Shifley for a chunk of time when Blake Wheeler was out, and it didn't go as well as what we had anticipated. What I really like about those two players in particular, Huss, on the weekend was their ability to put the same thing that we talked about with Kyle Connor and Pierre Lutubois earlier in the year. Because of the electric and explosive speed of Ehlers, it forces Shifley to get into gear a little bit more and to get up the ice with the same kind of pace. Because we know that Mark Shifley is an exceptional skater, but I think that at times when he plays with Connor and Wheeler, he slows the game down. Now you're playing it at a little bit more hyper speed, but you're also able to you know, kind of have the speed of Ehlers push the defenseman back and create those shooting lanes for Shifley in the slot area. And those two did a nice job. I mean, we also know how good Mark Shifley is below the goal line, and Nikolai Ehlers going to some of the hard areas. Uh, I really like a lot of what those guys were able to do together, and their willingness to share the puck with one another, Huss. I mean, I think that there's always been kind of like a, I don't want to say Harlem Globetrotters element when those two play together, but they're both two guys that like to have the puck on their stick a lot. So sometimes that doesn't necessarily gel as well. But what I saw in the weekend games was that both of those guys, there was plenty of puck to go around and they were quite both willing to share it. And both with themselves and with Paul Stastny, who again, just makes such so many great small area kind of plays to put those guys into position to use their explosive speed and their shots. I mean, that, that's always going to be the thing. You got two elite level shooters and two elite level skaters. And then you have the brains of Stastny, who also brings plenty of skill to the table as well. And the same thing too, like when Andrew Kopp plays with Mark Shifley, uh, Paul is very, you know, as, you know, assertive and smart when it comes to the defensive zone play. So he's kind of like a safety blanket or a buffer uh, when he plays with those two guys. And, uh, I really liked a lot of what I saw from those guys. But, I mean, to your original premise, I mean, yes, Nikolai Ehlers, uh, you know, could benefit for sure. Uh, I think he's a guy who, I mean, we came out of the year using the word superstar. And that I, I thought that he could push for 40 goals. I mean, he's starting to inch his way up there. I mean, it's going to be tough to get to that number. But I think you can mark him down for 30-plus. And Nikolai Ehlers is the kind of guy, Huss, that if he gets hot and if the power play gets hot, I still think he could – make a run at 35 to 40 this year don't you well i certainly hope so we've got the over on 28 and a half so it's been nice <laughs> to see him it's been nice to see him heat up as of late um and we certainly know that he's capable of it and part of it is getting that opportunity i think that if he and shifley can you know establish some chemistry that at times as you mentioned had been lacking when they'd been put together before um it bodes very, very well for the Winnipeg Jets because we've seen what Dubois and Connor can do um, really is the best center and the best winger that they've had so far this year. And if both of those lines are going, 
I mean, that's been one of the biggest issues for the Winnipeg Jets at times this year. They've had one, but they haven't had the other. And I'll tell you what, I mean, this goes back to your uh, initial point. Adding Andrew Kopp back with Adam Lowry completely changes that line. Um, and I know that it had been planned under Paul Maurice. I mean, they practiced that way for the, uh, the, the Tuesday and Wednesday heading into that game. Um, but it just significantly changes what you get out of that third line, as well as the way you can play them. And especially with the last change, as Dave Lowry utilized them, um, going up against that top line, it gives you maybe some softer matchups for your number one and two lines. And that, that is a good thing. As far as the blue line goes, um, and I know there was, uh, you know, some, some in and out from practice over the last little bit, but you see much changing on the blue line under Dave Lowry, or, or if you're Dave Lowry, when you're looking at the blue line, is there anything you're considering or is it just sort of a wait and see as we progress? It's a great question, Huston. I mean, that was one of the questions that I was asking Paul Maurice in the week leading up to his resignation. I wondered, you know, we saw the blander get such a high voltage uh, when it came to the forwards, but the defense pairs had stayed the same outside of now Nate Schmidt leaving uh, and the times when they ran with seven. But I mean, if you're Dave Lowry, you saw the way Dylan DeMello played with Josh Morrissey again. Would you be tempted to kind of run that a little bit longer? I mean, it's possible. I mean, one of the things that I mentioned to Sean the other day, I mean, how about, and this is nothing to do with Nate Schmidt, because I think that Nate Schmidt and Josh Morrissey, quite frankly, have been the Jets' best defense pair. Uh, there's an element for me, I'm curious to see what Nate Schmidt and Brendan Dillon looks like as a, you know, as a traditional shutdown pairing. Uh, and then also there'd be some curiosity in terms of we've often see that big and bigger guys, you know, undersized guy. What about Pionk and, and Logan Stanley? I mean, I don't know if that's a way that they would go. I, I would doubt it. But um, I mean, if you're Dave Lowry, you would you would have to be giving consideration to DeMello and Morrissey. But I also think that we can't get overrun by recency bias and and, you know, the fact that the top pair so far this year has been Schmidt and Morrissey. And I would say that their good games have outweighed their bad games by a pretty steady margin, um, there would be some maybe reluctance to make a change there. And then the other thing too, I mean, we also know that Dylan uh, and Dylan DeMello have been partners before. I mean, I, I'd be curious to some degree to, to test that out at some point, but um, I mean, it's it, I don't have a great answer for you, Hasse. There are certain things that you could definitely see uh, going into the chemistry lab, trying out a few experiments but I don't think we're going to see a lot of changes with the pairings. But I mean, if you're Dylan DeMello, you've been waiting for a shot to get onto the top pairing. I think he asserted himself uh, quite well. Well, uh, and interesting maybe, that he got that opportunity, Ken, considering uh, when Neil Pionk got injured. I mean, we talked about this. It right. was, I mean, I think surprising to a lot of people that never mind Dylan DeMello didn't get up into that spot. They moved Logan Stanley into that spot on his offside up until they realized that wasn't a good idea and then swapped them. But Dylan still stayed on that final pairing. Um, is Billy Hanel a closer to the NHL today because Paul Maurice isn't in the mix? Uh, I think it's a fair question, Huss. I mean, I think we were kind of prodding and poking at Kevin Shevel day off in the, in the press conference on Friday. I mean, he, he himself used the term injection of youth, which prompted me to follow up by saying, did you think an injection of youth is needed right now? And then obviously Marat uh, Tesh followed up later on, and specifically speaking to Hanela. Uh, closer, yes, but closer because of his own play. I don't think it's because of the coaching change. Uh, I do think that, you know, there, we know that Billy Hanela is probably ready on the offensive side already. Um, like how much is it the general manager and the coach? Because I, I think we're naive to think, oh, this is just Paul Maurice. He doesn't like young players. I mean, that's obviously not the case. I mean, everything is in lockstep. But... There were a few things that Chevaldeoff said that were very interesting in that press yeah. conference on Friday morning that I think gave some people the idea that maybe we would see some of the things that you guys were asking about. We certainly didn't get any clarity on that, but I do wonder um, if this, you know, the entire plan all along with Billy being there was entirely starting above the coaching staff, or if Maurice was a big influence in that, that with him being out of the picture and Dave Lowry in there, might there be more of an opportunity to get him in? Um, I assume that injury, like usually is the case, will be what is the catalyst for that. But I am interested to see if they, if that doesn't happen, do they think, man, we got a guy that's ready to go. I wonder if we you know, stick him into the lineup and see what happens. Sure, Huss. I mean, it's a fair comment. What I would say about Hanala is that I think the Jets just felt he needed some more seasoning, quite frankly. I know that some fans don't agree with that that uh, theory, or the theory is that 
yes, the veteran players are making mistakes too. So then you may as well have the guy that has more skill, but I mean, who is Billy Hanley going to replace? Is it Logan Stanley? I mean, it's hard to imagine the Jets have gone from protecting Logan Stanley to saying, you know what, you're just the seventh defenseman right now. So uh, for him, that to me is where you maybe have the issue. So like you said, uh, it's probably going to come down to an injury situation. I mean, by all accounts, Hanley is playing pretty well down in the farm. But I mean, it's not going to be about the points he produces. It's going to be about his ability to defend at this level. So um, again, who's he going to fill? You know, he's not playing it. We just finished saying that Dylan DeMello did a great job stepping up in the first pairing. I mean, you're not playing Hanley ahead of Dylan DeMello. So you're, you're not, probably not playing him ahead of the two guys you brought in in trade. And you're not playing him ahead of Neil Pionki, who just signed to a long-term extension. So then it becomes Logan Stanley versus Billy Hanela for the sixth spot. And right now, Logan Stanley still has um, full command of that spot. So uh, if the Jets get to a, a situation, Huss, where they have trouble with their exits, like they did last year for an extended period of time, yes, of course, Billy Hanela would be, I think, a lot closer to becoming a regular. But short of that and short of an injury, I mean, I think right now, as much as it is probably unfortunate for him, he needs to dominate at the American Hockey League level, which by all accounts he is doing in a lot of fronts. And eventually that opportunity will come. I mean, could it come as a power play quarterback at, at some point? I mean, maybe, but I don't see the Jets bringing Handle up to be the seventh defenseman and run the second power play. That that just doesn't seem to be a good usage of minutes either. Uh, I think we always forget. I mean, Handle is 20 years old. Us. I mean, this is the thing that we always forget because he came right in to the league as an 18 year old and had a couple flashy moments, had a couple dangles. I think especially the game against the Rangers was one where you think, whoa, this guy's pretty <laughs> impressive. Um, you think that it has to happen and fast forward everything. So to me, the fact he's still 20 years old, is there frustration for Billy Hanel the way the last two years have gone? I'm sure there can't be anything other than that. But I think this is a guy who's a good pro. He knows what the long-term goal is. And he's going to do everything in his power to get there. This is, And for the folks who are wondering if this is CBA or contract related, Hanel is 20 years old. He had the entry-level slide happened. This year is going to be used. So this is not about not using him for 10 games, not burning it. He's using the year of his year. One of the ELC is currently being used, whether he's in the American league or the NHL. I think there's still an opportunity for him to contribute this year. Does that mean he becomes a regular? It's too early to tell, but this is a player who the jets still view very highly. You know, we look at their system. He has the best opportunity to become a first pairing defenseman. So even though it may be taking a bit a little bit longer than many people hope, this is a guy who the Jets still view as a very important part of their future. And, you know, when that present happens, that part of that's going to be up to the organization and the other part's going to be up to Hanela to pretty much like, much like with David Gustafson, you're going to force your way into the mix and that's the best opportunity you'll have to get into the mix. But Gustafson is is training for a fourth line role. Mm -hmm. Hanela is is training for a top pairing role eventually. So even though it may again, it's taking longer than some people would like, playing twenty to twenty four minutes at the American League level is still probably what's best in the long range development. If it gets to the point where one of the veterans is struggling, Huss, by all means, you'll have an opportunity to have a look at Billy Hanela. So that's a long-winded way of saying, I don't think that the coaching change has changed his circumstances very much, but we'll see. You know, it, you know there's a chance for a mini training camp coming out of Boxing Day if that game on the 27th is not played. Um, I'm not expecting Billy Hanela to be called up for that practice, but I mean, time will tell. I do think we're going to see Hanela up in the lineup, and I understand folks wish they had seen him against the Seattle Kraken, but his games will be played this year. It's just a matter of when they're going to be coming. That's a great point. Ken Weave with us. Hey, one final one on the Jets. Um, I know we don't know when it's going to happen, but we do expect Blake Wheeler to get back into the lineup at some point. How do you think the new coach, new coach handles the return of the captain? Well, you know, Huss, when he came back the first time from COVID, uh, Paul Maurice was not afraid to use him with Mark Scheifele and Adam Lowry on the third line, essentially. I mean, they didn't play third line minutes, but um, it, it's all going to, you touched on it earlier. The health will be one part. But Blake Wheeler is also playing a different style of hockey than he was when he went out the first time. So uh, I don't think it's an automatic that he gets tossed in with Mark Scheifele. It'll depend on how Ehlers and Scheifele go. Uh, we also know that Blake Wheeler has a history of playing well with Pierre-Luc Dubois when he first came to the Winnipeg Jets last year. I think year. it's more likely to end up with Dubois and Connor, to be honest, than, than Scheifele and Ehlers. 
Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, in the first game, if he needs to play 15, 16 minutes, I could see him start with Lowry. But I also think there's a chance that that he could be used with Dubois and, and that he could be quite effective uh, with that line. But, I mean, could, Dave could Lowry, Lowry also... Could Lowry and be a long-term spot for him? Uh, you know what, Huss? I mean, I think I touched on this a while ago. I think there was one game, against, exhibition game against the Calgary Flames, I want to say it was three years ago, where it was one of those where they just had the minimum number of veterans in the game, mm-hmm. but that's the line that played together, and they were absolutely on fire. And again, this was partly they were probably you know maybe it was a you know there it was a lot You're of playing the, the Bakersfield Condors, <laughs> Stockton Heat or whatever. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Or uh, going back to the Abbotsford Heat, even maybe, but uh, they were very good together. And uh, on that kind of thing, situation, the one thing that gets lost. I mean. Um, Blake Wheeler's a guy who scored 20 goals, I think, eight times. So, and the other one of the years he had 19 in a shortened season. So, this is a guy who's he can put the puck in the net. So, he could be a trigger man with those two players. Uh, but also, too, I, I think that he's there's going to be more versatility with Blake. He's not just going to be a guy who can only play with Mark Shifley. Um, but for sure, I mean, you know, how severe was the injury? I mean, Based on the timeline, sprained MCL seems like the most logical conclusion, even though we know it's still being just talked about as a long-term injury reserve and in, in, in a surgery was not required. Um, how long does it take to get back up to speed? Because what we saw, Hustler, in that game against the Vancouver Canucks was Blake Wheeler at speed, the speed that we're used to seeing him. He benefited during that week from the two-day break between games, and then he looked like he got his skating legs back. And I mean... Looked like his energy level was back. So uh, we know that Blake Wheeler is a hard worker. And as soon as he can get back up to speed, he's going to be want to want to be back on the ice and in the lineup. But we also know it's a big chunk of time and block of games that is missed. So, you know, does he have to play 22 minutes out of the gate? No, he does not. So, I mean, now it's up to Dave Lowry to you know, either have that be the case or for Blake Wheeler to show that he deserves more, more ice time than whatever amount of minutes that are allotted to him uh, coming out of the gate so but yeah I mean it, it's an interesting situation on a number of levels I mean Blake Wheeler will be around the team but he's going to see um, in real time how Dave Lowry is kind of building this culture and kind of putting the team together I think there'll be some breadcrumbs and hints in terms of where Wheeler will fit in but we won't really know until he's back in the lineup because he's been so durable you don't know how he's going to respond to this kind of injury other than he's going to give you everything that he possibly has and then we'll see where that 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 has him slotting in and and what that means for minutes. But uh, I think first and foremost, you can take the p- penalty killing minutes off the table, at least at the beginning. And if you have to go back to him, you know that you can use him there because he was effective in the role when he was used there. But we can't forget the reason why Blake Wheeler was taken off the penalty kill to begin with is because of the taxing nature of those minutes. So uh, the Jets are going to need to find some internal solutions to help ease off some of the minutes on their, you know, high yeah, Hopefully the PK is not struggling by the time Wheeler <laughs> comes back. And you know what? Hey, it looked pretty good. They had some good results on the no, weekend. So you do we, hope yeah. that that continues. And I will say this, we don't need to get into it, but a very simple change in the power play of swapping the guys onto their off wings to open up the, uh, the one timers seem to uh, make it significantly more dangerous on the weekend. We'll look to see that continue. Kenny, what's up for the holidays? And what's up tomorrow at 3 p.m. after our holiday festive <laughs> extravaganza when we turn it over to you and Rennie on uh, your YouTube channel? Well, uh, my apologies. Uh, we, we're taking a COVID, not COVID break, but we're, uh, we're, uh, we had Kevin Bieksa lined up, but uh, we had a little bit of uh, mis- malfunction at the junction uh, <laughs> in terms of the timing. And Kevin's driving up to his cottage uh, and it just the service is not going to be quite as good. So the uh, the holiday rendition of the Kenny and Rennie show is we're also like the NHL going on pause for the break. Uh, we hope that folks can understand and we'll be uh, hopefully all the, the people th- that I, I plugged it like three times <laughs> early in the program. So, we, so hopefully yeah, people no. got here this late and realized <laughs> actually uh, update on uh, this uh, yeah, much like the yeah. latest in the NHL cancellations. The Thursday 3 p.m. edition of yeah. Kenny and Rennie, a, uh, a, a, a another another casualty. Sad state of affairs, Huss, but uh, I hope folks understand. And, uh, you know, while we're plugging things, uh, I know you got a lot of Jets fans in the chat. Folks, the uh, the December NHL Jets mailbag uh, wide is open. wide open, and we're uh, we're still taking questions till probably at least till Saturday. So if you got something on your mind, uh, hit me up on the DM at Weebs World or at KenJR at Shaw.ca with your Jets questions. 
I'll have a, a Jets prospect piece going up uh, this afternoon. And uh, other than that, we'll have the mailbag run on Sunday, and, and then we'll kind of go from there. But uh, it's an exciting time. Uh, you know, we know the restrictions are back in place, but uh, for those of you that can spend some time with your families and friends uh, during the holiday season, uh, obviously, I'm wishing you guys all the best. And thanks for listening and watching and for all your support, both of Hustler's show and of ours. And uh, it's been an interesting uh, start of the season. The first 30 games, Hustler, there were a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, ups and downs and uh, – a lot of turbulence to navigate for the Winnipeg Jets, but uh, we're doing our best to talk about it, write about it, uh, chat about it. And uh, you know what? Sports has been a great release from uh, society on a lot of levels, and it's been fun to be able to chop it up with you and, and your listeners. And uh, we're looking forward to – oh, no, we're going to get one more in before the new year, right, Huss? So I don't Absolutely, have to get all, yes. I don't it's, have to get all sappy now. And uh, no, but The overall, Weebs World Year in Review visit <laughs> next year. And it, and what okay, a year perfect. it's been. There's been lot, lots to get to, so we'll touch on all that. Listen, all the best to you and the family. I have a great few days, and uh, we will talk next week, hopefully about a game on the 27th against the Wild. We'll play that by ear, but uh, we'll definitely chat one more time in 2021. Right on, Huss. Merry Christmas to you and uh, and your crew as well, my man. Thank you. Right, right back at you. Our guy, Kenny Weeb at Weeb's World on Twitter. Uh, and yes, get those suggestions and questions in for Weeber's mailbag, which will be coming out on Sunday at sportsnet.ca. Hey, the holidays are here. Many of you probably not wanting to go out. I got a great solution for you to get the best tasting beer in Manitoba without leaving your house. And that is going to littlebrownjug.ca and ordering all those delicious 1919s, maybe sneak in a winter variety pack. Maybe try out a few of the uh, new Brute IPA, the uh, celebratory champagne-like beer brewed for Little Brown Jug's five-year anniversary. When you're at the website, uh, you got much more uh, incredible merchandise, brand new toques, great shirts, hoodies, and whatnot, as well as gift boxes that are curated by the folks at Little Brown Jug or... You can make it yourself, and there is free delivery citywide. So get on over there. If you are out and about, pop by the tap room on William Avenue and get set for the holidays. Um, Princess Auto curling report is good news for the mixed championships. December 28th, we will begin the tournament down the highway in Portage La Prairie, and it is a go officially yesterday by Curling Canada. We do expect there to be 50% capacity. Um play that by year depending on how things go over the next few days but the athletes are there they will be competing uh and of course princess auto's uh sponsor team of uh, our good friend chelsea carey and colin hodgkin were the last team to get in we wish them luck and all the other competitors out in portage next week of course princess auto is the place where you'll find the best deals and most, most unique assortment of tools and equipment around Everything you need to complete the projects on your list or something new is at Princess Auto, where they help you make it work. Two locations in Winnipeg. Great Facebook page with a 30-minute video and some awesome gift ideas if you're still stuck. Uh, and, of course, you can shop online 24-7, 365 at princessauto.com. And, uh, you know, it might not be... You know, the Christmas turkey, but I'll tell you what, they got a great festive holiday menu over at Boston Pizza. You can get that in a store with the family or, of course, in the lounge. And you can always order the great taste of Boston Pizza, those gourmet pizzas, Boston's wings, ice cold schooners, more in the lounge. But you can always order it at bostonpizza.com or give a ring to your local Boston Pizza. All right, let's get Remus back in here. Um, we do want to get to the cool bet lines. I'm going to tell you, stick around, Bomber fans. Uh, we've got photos of these uh, really cool Jim Beam Winnipeg Blue Bomber Grey Cup Championship glasses. Um, but we'll do that at the end as well as a plug for our friends over at Nick and Nicky DQ and what they've got coming up for the holiday season. But Remo, one of the funny things we were talking about this morning was what's happening in the NBA. And as the NBA looks to continue their season right now with so many guys going on the COVID list and such small benches, it is like a uh, an alumni game right now with some of the names of guys that are getting signed. I just saw Lance Stevenson. Like, remember the big three league, Ice Cube's big three? Half the big three, it seems like, is on the verge of signing 10-day contracts in the NBA right now. I mean, this is hilarious um, as far as what's going on in the NBA. I mean, yeah, they they have the small, ro you know, small rosters, the NBA, but... 
players are coming out and they're chugging along. So you just got to find some other other bodies. So um, Joe Johnson, I saw this one. He's 40 years old, hasn't played in the NBA for three years. Sign him up. Sign it. And they got these 10-day contracts in the NBA. Um, it's crazy. So we started talking. We're like, well, you know, the NHL, they have teams right now, like, playing shorthanded, like, less than a full roster because whatever reason, they didn't amend the salary caps, you know, in case they ran into trouble. But what if they did have 10-day contracts in the NHL and you needed to bring in a body quick? I mean, who do you think the Jets or any other NHL team would look to bring in? You and I had a couple um, brainstorm. Well, and again, that- we're talking about just getting guys in warm bodies that maybe have some NHL experience, maybe have some connection to the team or the area. Maybe they're back for the holidays. Uh, a guy that stood out to me was a guy that had a cup of coffee here, didn't really last in the National Hockey League, but of course is Quinton Howden of Oak Bank, Manitoba. <laughs> He's playing overseas right now, but you know, maybe these guys get a little Christmas break. They're back here right now. They could jump on it. And I got to give a shout out to Derek Meach as well, who's doing a great job along with the Finker calling uh, Manitoba Moose games this year. But Meach could still play. I'm sure we could squeeze 10 to 15 minutes on the blue line out of Meach if, uh, well, if it was one of those situations where you were desperate to get a body with a little bit of experience coming in. Who, who, who are you going to add? Yeah, in? I see Leighton Janice uh, giving a shout out to Mark Stewart. I mean, he had a job with uh, True North. He was in here for a while. Uh, last played 2017-18. That's like three years, I think. Still young, 37. He's 37. Uh, you know, he's got experience on the blue line. Why not call up uh, Mark Stewart? Sign to a 10-day contract if you need a D. Why not? Well, I, I would jump on Paul Postma if he was available. The postman, you know, I don't know. He was a guy. It never worked out for him really in the National Hockey League. He bounced around a little bit. He's still playing at a really high level over in Austria. I'm not sure whether he'd be uh, available. One guy that did retire not too long ago that you could definitely count in to come into the lineup, former Winnipeg Jet, longtime AHL star, Tango, Eric Tangrady. Oh, I'm pretty reti- sure Tang Grady can come off the couch and get into a lineup and give you eight to nine solid minutes. He just, uh, I think he just started, uh, got a real estate license. I follow him on uh, on Twitter. I Christopher see some- Matt, you know exactly where I'm going with this. Absolutely. Number one on the list. Number two in your program. Number one in your heart. The legendary Adam Party. Now, it might be difficult to get him from Newfoundland back to the peg, but if he could get on that plane, he's in my lineup in an emergency situation of a depleted NHL squad. You have to think, you know, seeing what's happening with the NBA, the NHL is going to alter there. I mean, I would I would hope that they alter it so, you know, teams can call up players because, again, we've seen so many teams not dress a full roster for a game. I know a couple of years ago, Hus, the Jets brought this guy in at the trade deadline, needed to shore up the room. He would fit in with the Minnesota Mafia. He is from Minnesota. I think Matt Hendricks, he's a guy, fit right hey, in the in director the room. of morale. Hey, yes. These are tough times. These are tough times right now for everyone, including NHL players. So, not sure how much you're going to get from him on the ice, but in the room, it doesn't matter how old Matt Hendricks is, he will always be the director of morale for the Winnipeg Jets if he is in that room. Hey, he played a couple of years ago, on um, last played in 2019 with the Jets, got into four games, so I honestly, I think uh, I think you could bring him in if you needed to. Another one, hey, this is a chaos, this one's I got a couple that are off the board for the Jets, who you could bring in. I was thinking J.P. V.J., you know, we've had him on the show, he played pro. Still I don't know. in great shape. On the ice for like eight hours every day. This isn't a guy that just retired and put on 80 pounds and is crushing a six-pack every day. I think he's more of like an emergency. Like if they had emergency forwards, you had to bring in for like one day rather than bring in a guy for a 10-day contract. But what about... He's not doing back-to-backs right now. But but if they needed needed a guy for the practice or something and they brought in Andrew Harris, coming off two Grey Cup wins. I've seen him on the ice before, man. This guy's a bulldozer. He can definitely skate. Uh, throw him in a, throw him in a practice. I think it's, it's time. <laughs> Funny you mentioned Harris. Uh, I'm going to, I was going to throw out Cam Meredith. I mean, yeah. uh, he's here. His girlfriend lives in Winnipeg. He's available. He's played in the best league in the world. Oh, sorry. That was the national football league. I, I'm getting it mixed up right now, yeah. but, uh, you know, we're always talking, well, Hey, here's another guy. And I'm not even joking about this one. Like if it actually did come to this crazy scenario where, 
teams, but basically with what's happening in the uh, NH or the NBA right now, they were a guy that I saw still in great shape and not too far removed from the National Hockey League and a Winnipeg guy. I saw him at the Hockey Helps the Homeless event was Ryan Garbett. Yes. Uh, Garbino. Garbino could absolutely get into the lineup. And uh, I think he was a very shrewd draft pick for whatever team picked him at Hockey Helps the Homeless. Far closer to his NHL playing days than some of the other guys. And we're really screwed. My buddy Russ Romanek. Romanek was out there. And I know Roma said he hadn't skated really throughout the pandemic. But from all accounts, at the Hockey Helps the Homeless beat, Roma was looking very, very good. And Roma, if you've seen him as of late, has incredible hockey hair. I think he's been inspired by Kyle Connor's flow. And uh, is uh, the hair would be big league, uh, even if the play might not be up to par. Yeah, I, I think, look, hopefully Chevy's listening. If they ever need to do 10-day contracts in the NHL, I think we just did all the work. Get us on them. it. Get us on the case. Get, Ryan, I think Ryan Garbutt's probably the best one. I think he didn't open a fitness studio. I might have seen that uh, online. Played uh, 2019 in the DEL. I think that oh, might be, that might be a guy. Dembski, too. I, you know, listen, Mike Irving said, how about a couple of hometown bombers? You, of course, suggested uh, Hendricks. I'm not sure if Brady Oliveira is much of a hockey player. I know Nick Dembski can play. Uh, Nick Dembski was a hell of a hockey player. And I remember who I was talking to in and around Grey Cup week. When he went to the Bisons from Oak Park, I believe he was playing Charleswood Hawks at the time. I mean, football was his main thing. But once that was done, he was a star player for the Hawks. I believe the Harris do that too. Anyways, Dembski was for sure. Yeah. And uh, he'd be a guy that could absolutely come in. Maybe not play at an NHL level, but it'd be awesome for any sort of an old timers game. If they're the bombers used to go out and play these uh, broom ball games. If they did a hockey game with some of the bomber team, now that we've got enough local guys, I have a feeling Nick Dembski would be the starting center. I, I remember I played against to Harris and uh, men's league when he was with BC. And uh, I remember he was pretty quick and we'd be like, Oh, that guy's a returner for BC. And this was like before he had really done anything in the CFL. And then next thing we know, he's, most valuable Canadian in the Grey Cup, and we're like, oh, that guy we played against uh, in hockey is pretty good in the CFL. Well, this is crazy. So uh, that guy, he can definitely, he can definitely skate. If the if the Jets needed a a ten day contract, I mean, these guys are in town. I'm sure they could find find some bodies, and that might be. I mean, if they want to finish all the games, Hus, I mean, bring back the ten day contracts, bring back some legends. I know that, what Jim Slater, he's hanging around Michigan. Maybe he could hang on. <laughs> Uh, who knows? We could see see some uh, alumni. You know, each team needs a designated alumni spot, maybe. Uh, no doubt about squad. it. Well, and I, I saw someone mention Mike Keene in the chat, and I was talking about Mike Keene yesterday, just with a guy within the organization that might be a great addition to the coaching staff if yes. they are looking to add an assistant. I can tell you Mike Keene is still in ridiculous shape. So uh, somewhat removed from his playing career. But again, in a crunch Maybe we tap Keener on the shoulders. You'll certainly get that leadership as one of the best captains we've ever seen in the National Hockey League. Uh, fun. Add in your thoughts in the chat. Um, Timu, listen, Timu. Yeah, Timu's in. <laughs> Solani wants to play. He's in. They'll, we might even move him up the lineup. He can get some time on the top line. He can play with Connor and Dubois for, uh, for a few lines if, if need be. Sveshnikov's out anyways. There's for a sure. hole in the lineup. For sure. And I think a lot of people did. There's some good discussion in the chat also during Ken's conversation bringing up Appleton. Someone said, well, why would you want to bring in Appleton? And I was like, well, there's a number of reasons. One, well, first of all, right-hand shot, um, you know, plays well with Cop and Lowry, uh, low salary. And I think maybe you could get him for cheap because it seems not as is, good Is this of a the start of the free CL. Appleton movement? Is this the new we're guy to, that we're yeah. freeing now? We're trying to free Appleton. His career is getting held down in Seattle. Bring him back where he had success here. Still young. <laughs> Jim um, Carp. I was 20, I was 25. This, I, I how still, about the I, snarly Kenny Weeb? Ken can play. Ken can definitely play. He said King he's... Willie Jefferson on the power play. Can you imagine if Willie could skate? He'd be oh. the most imposing guy in the National Hockey League. Imagine him and, uh, yeah, Logan Stanley on the blue line. Aren't they both uh, around the same height? Two, two massive individuals. Albin Bale. My money would be on Marie-Philippe Poulain. Sign her. Mm hmm well, I'll tell you what, she's certainly going out in overtime. <laughs> All she does is score an overtime goal every single time they play the States. It's ridiculous. I, I watched that game after the Jets. It was after the Jets game. Um, was it Friday? I think, and she scored the overtime goal. I was tuning in. That, that was that was awesome hockey. Well, the so, funny yeah, thing I'd be is, three on three. 
we'll get to the Kubet lines in a minute, but she had just scored the overtime goal the night before, and mm-hmm. Kubet put out a prop at like eight to one. Will Mary Philippe Poulin score in overtime tonight? And she did it. <laughs> so anyone that got on that prop got a very, very nice yeah. boost. You know who else? Um, you know, she was at the skills competition in um in the All-Star game, uh, Kendall Coin Schofield. I mean, she I was watching her in that game. She blew by NHL level speed. Everyone. So and I, and you do wonder if you know they needed to call someone up in an emergency 10-day contract situation. Why not call up one of those uh, one of those ladies? This fantasy world that we've just created it's, would be very entertaining, I'll tell you that much. Well, we're we're living in it when they're calling up uh, people are speculating, <laughs> oh, will some NBA team sign Allen Iverson to a 10-day <laughs> contract? I saw someone speculate that and it's like kind of legitimate cuz they're like they keep playing the games. Players aren't available. They they don't really have like a huge, you know, minor league system like they do in uh in hockey or baseball. You don't just don't have guys ready. So yeah, Joe, Joe, you're at the point where you're signing Joe Johnson, who's 40 years old and hasn't played in three years. So uh, it's, inter- it's entertaining, I guess, right? No doubt about it. Hey, listen, I'm going to get to the cool bet lines in just a second, uh, but. Our friends at Nick and DQ D- D- are ready for Christmas. And if you haven't already, go on to their Instagram at DQ Manitoba. They've got the 12 days of Christmas over at DQ with some great giveaways for all of their followers. Make sure to give them a follow. And if you need a cake for your holiday gathering, order it online. Just simply hit them up with a message. They'll let you let them know what they want on it. They'll get it ready for you. You could pick it up ready to go quick and easy at any of the four Nick and Nikki DQs. Of course, that is the DQ in Niverville, DQ Northgate, DQ Polo Park, and DQ St. Anne's, now open year-round and available on Skip the Dishes and Uber Eats. And check this out. I mentioned this yesterday, but I had stupidly forgot to send the pictures in. Um, Our friends at Canadian Club and their sister bottle, Jim Beam, all under the Beam Suntory umbrella, proud sponsors of the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, have awesome new limited edition glasses. I can't believe how quickly they turn these things around. There's displays up in 20 Manitoba liquor marts right now. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see Willie Jefferson on the boxes and is a commemorative 2021 Jim Beam Grey Cup glass that is free with your purchase of Jim Beam. So uh, pop by, you Bomber fans. At your local Manitoba Liquor Marts, get your hands on that. And in the meantime, check out the Canadian Club displays. You could win 5,000 bonus air miles as well as bonus air miles on all of your Canadian Club purchases. But uh, there you have it. That's the display in Manitoba Liquor Marts. Jim Beam with the special, very limited edition. And essentially, all of the co- product that they have is out at the 20 stores. I believe 18 of them are in Winnipeg. If you are looking for them, you might want to call your location first just to make sure they have them. But they're out now until they're gone. The Great Cup Champions, a limited edition glass with our friends over at Jim Beam. All right, let's get to the cool bet lines. And uh, not much going on tonight. Uh, as I mentioned, um, probably watching wrestling later on. But tomorrow, the NFL is back, <laughs> and uh, we've got a great, great game. Now, they have no AEW lines on Cool Bet, unfortunately. Uh, but we do have great Thursday nighter tomorrow. The Niners at the Tennessee Titans. San Francisco, three-and-a-half-point favorites on the road against Mike Vrabel's Titans. And then a full slate of games right now. Most of the games on the board, one game not on the board is the Chiefs at Steelers. And uh, after taking first place in the AFC on Thursday night, uh, it's like half the team has COVID, including everyone impactful with the exception of Patrick Mahomes, Tyreek Hill, uh, Travis Kelsey. Um, Now, those guys are vaccinated, so they can play if they test negative before the game. Fingers crossed that happens. They will have a new kicker, though. Apparently, our genius kicker, Harrison Butker, is... uh, not vaccinated, so he doesn't have the opportunity to come back. He will miss the game on the weekend. Uh, Elliot Gay going to get the opportunity to kick in Butker's spot. All the lines over at Cool Bet. Uh, but I think what's most interesting to Canadian fans right now is the World Junior Hockey Championship odds. We've got odds for everything. Uh, the winners of the groups, Canada minus 400 to win their group. Uh, USA and Russia and Sweden all right in the mix for Group B. That might be a fun bet to make. Um, you got head-to-head matchups between teams. 
You've got top goal scorers for the tournament. Cole Perfetti tied for first, along with uh, well, Matt Mitchkov, the uh, Phenom from Russia, Mason McTavish, Berniers from Canada, and Alexander Holtz as well. Um, let's see, a number of Canadians up there. Dylan Gunther's at 13. Shane Wright's at 13. Cole Perfetti's the favorite for the top tournament point score, 8-1, to one, to lead the tournament in scoring. Um, they've also got goals. They've got some interesting props. The Canadian goaltender, Sebastian Kosa, save percentage over or under 94 and a half. Wow, that, that is a very, very high number. I think I might be taking the under on that, although I'd love to see him throw it up. And then the tournament most valuable player, Cole Perfetti, top of the list again, 7-1, to one, along with Owen Power, last year's number one overall pick. And as far as the odds to win the entire event, Canada is the favorite at plus 140. Never a lot of value on Canada because it's such a big, big event here. So many people bet on it. The number is quite low. Uh, but if you did want to take a sprinkle on some of the other squads, USA plus 350, Russia plus 450, Sweden 6-1. to one. I find that interesting. We'll talk to Scott Wheeler about that as well tomorrow. He, I think he's quite high on the Swedes. And uh, Finland, 7-1. to one. Those are really the favorites. you got to get all the way down to 50-1 to one after that for the Czech Republic. Coolbet Canada is the spot. Coolbet.com. If you've never played a Coolbet before, use the promo code WST for a 100% bonus on your first deposit up to $200. Um, this has been a real fun show. And tomorrow, of course, remote the holiday festive extravaganza. We will have a marble race. And we will also, are we ready to officially say we will be doing the uh, the trivia game tomorrow? I saw it on the Twitch last night. It looked amazing. I think we're going to be ready to go. Yeah, I tested out uh, some trivia yesterday. Um, I have an idea of the uh, appropriate difficulty for the questions and how to do them. So uh, we'll have some, we got, hopefully we can run two of them, but we have some Jets trivia questions, uh, Bomber, Grey Cup ones, and we've got some prizes. Yeah, uh, I went I'm, to Royal yesterday, mm -hmm. the Bomber Championship hat for our Grey Cup trivia. And uh, we've got a couple really neat toques. Uh, one of the, uh, not the Heritage, but well, I guess sort of the Heritage type that you'll see some of the players wearing. And then another one, the Reverse Retro, which I thought was really cool. So I'll uh, have a couple of those to give away, whether we do them both tomorrow or do one of them next week. Uh, bottom line, pop by Royal Sports and mm -hmm. got those yesterday. Still some amazing selection of uh, all Bomber and Jets gear heading into the holidays. Yeah, so how it's going to work. I mean, if you're in the chat, uh, you, you're, you can play. You'll have to go to a different website, either on your phone or another browser window. And, um, you know, you put in, go to a website, put in the code and sign, and sign your name and email, and you'll be able to, uh, to go in. So and it's multiple choice. It's not like you're sitting there thinking and it's timed, so you can't Google it. But the faster you answer, the more points you get. So. Uh, I'm very, uh, very excited to debut. I've been, has I've been wanting to do trivia. Like I wanted to get like people in studio for a game show on the old station, but like fully produced. But we never, you know, I could never do that. But uh, to do that on here, uh, well, you know, at on, a certain point, you know, yeah. we're gonna get this done tomorrow, and we'll kind of help out. I'll be involved in the questions and running it. But I will once we get this going. Um, I will throw down and go up against all the listeners at some point. And uh, like, I will participate and see if I can take everybody out. Or I know that they'll be coming at me to uh, humiliate me as getting losing in trivia, sports trivia to our listeners. So um, that is something coming up in 2022. But yes, tomorrow, second hour of the program, going to be a lot of fun. We will do the trivia game. Uh, we'll have a limit of 100 people to get in, so make sure that you are with us beforehand to get the information and uh, play with all of us, and then we'll finish it off with a holiday marble race. And before that, Scott Wheeler tees up the World Juniors from The Athletic and a festive holiday visit from one of the jolliest men we know. That, of course, is the voice of the Winnipeg Jets, Polly Edmonds. So um, it should be a great, great uh, afternoon heading into a few days off and fingers crossed we've got this game against the wild on the 27th. But I guess as we talk with Ken Weave, especially with the winter classic right afterwards, that's somewhat up in the air right now. Thanks to everyone that joined us. Thanks so much to Shane Malloy who popped on the program and a great holiday chat with our pal, Kenny Weeb. 
Uh, and once again, to all of our sponsors, if you're doing some last minute shopping, if you have the opportunity to support them, they're the reason why we're able to do this every day. Would really appreciate it. And always let them know. Guys at Winnipeg Sports Talk sent you F Apparel. You can get those gift cards on the, with 15% off before Christmas Day. Big Boxing Day sale coming up next week. Our friends at Vita Health Fresh Market, seven locations in Winnipeg. Culligan, the water experts in southern Manitoba for 65 years. Donnie and the gang powering the city over at Manitoba Battery. Royal Sports, all that Bomber Championship gear is here right now. Our friends at Not Auto Corp over at Waverly and McGilvery. Little Brown Jug. A perfect addition to any holiday gathering or celebration. Our friends at Princess Auto, lots of great gift ideas there. Boston Pizza, well, Boston Pizza is great 24-7, 365. But if you are out meeting up with some friends, that's a great place to do it. Uh, the Nick and Nicky TQ Group, Canadian Club Whiskey, and don't forget those special Bomber Limited Edition Grey Cup glasses are in local Manitoba Liquor Marts with purchase of Jim Beam. And of course, our friends at Cool Bet Canada. One more show before the official Christmas weekend holidays. We will not be doing a show on Christmas Eve, but we will be doing one tomorrow, a holiday festive extravaganza on Winnipeg Sports Talk. Paul Edmonds is going to join us a little bit more on the World Juniors with Scott Wheeler. Trivia game marbles. Do not miss it. Folks, have a great night. Stay safe. Be well. And we'll talk to you tomorrow right here on Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Oh, my God. Shut it down. Thanks for tuning in to Winnipeg Sports Talk Daily. Make sure to subscribe on YouTube and your favorite podcast feed at winnipegsportstalk.com.